This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Okay. Um, good evening. Seeing as we have, oops, yeah. Seeing as we have a quorum of the town council on July 6th, 2020, I'm going to start the meeting. Let me start by saying, uh, based on Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are allowed to hold this virtual town council. I will call upon each councilor by name. And at that time, they should unmute your mic and say present. And they, you will also indicate if you can hear me and I can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic when you're not speaking and after saying present. This is also how we will conduct counselor comments throughout the agenda. The meeting includes audio and video and is available live on Amherst Media. And it is also being recorded. There is no chat room for this meeting. If technical issues arise, I may call a, a pause in the meeting until we can see if we can straighten them out. And the record will have to show that we have done that. Um, if you need to have, a, if you have a technical problem, be in, please be in touch with Athena. And meantime, then let me start by calling the town council individuals. Um, so we're going to start with um, Alyssa Brewer. Present. George Ryan. Present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Steve Schreiber. Here. Tony <clears throat> Ball-Milne. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Um, Evan Ross. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. And let me just check if anybody else has joined us. Uh, and Dorothy Pam. Present. Okay, um, Serge, you can take the screen down while we just spend a little time. Thank you. Um, I do have one announcement. I'm sorry, I am gonna have you put this up. And there'll be more information on the town website as of tomorrow, but the town of Amherst, Amherst COVID-19 Emergency Rental Assistance Grant Program is now available and this is through Community Action. And again, more information will be available on the town website. Other than this, we're not going to go through any other announcements tonight. Please check the town calendar for other meetings of which we have several this uh, month. So thank you. You can take that down. Um, in this year of COVID-19, as a nation, we have again experienced significant concerns about policing initiatives, most recently initiated most recently by the murder of George Floyd. Upon that event, the town council joined the Amherst town manager, police chief, and school superintendent, the chair of the Human Rights Commission with full support of the police unions, and unanimously passed a resolution in the aftermath of the death of Mr. George Floyd, introduced by a powerful statement by Councillor Pat DeAngelis. Each councillor in our own way has participated in follow-up discussions with many others, including the police chief and his staff and with the Human Rights Commission, which is sponsoring community conversations posted on the town's bulletin board. This brings us to tonight. The Amherst Town Council is taking this opportunity to begin to better understand the state of policing in Amherst. Therefore, this meeting was established to allow the council to have an informative public discussion with the police department about the police department regarding their mission, 
organization, operations, training, policies, and accountability. The meeting will include a presentation by Police Chief Scott Livingstone, who will be supported by other members of his staff, specifically Captain Gabriel Ting, officer in charge of patrol operations, and Captain Robert Ronald Young, officer in charge of administration. Fire Chief Tim Nelson has also joined us if questions arise about the relationship between police and to fire and EMS. After we're done with the presentation, which we're going to go through without any questions, there will be opportunity for counselors to ask questions and to discuss what they've heard. And as part of that, uh, and after that, we will then have um, public comment. This is part of an ongoing conversation. And tonight, no changes in strategy, oversight, or budgets will be made at this meeting. We welcome questions and comments from the public at this meeting and following the meeting. Comments received thus far have been posted as part of the meeting packed. So with that, Mr. Bachman, would you please proceed? Thank you, Lynn. Serge, do you want to put up the, um, the slide? So tonight, as uh, we do this, the, um, put up the graphics for us. Um, we're here to talk about systemic racism, actually, is the broader topic and the systemic racism that permeates our society. We know we have significant disparities in the outcomes of race and class by our healthcare system. We know we fight the opportunity or educational debt that we experience in our educational system. We know that housing policies continue to disadvantage African Americans through historical housing policies. We know that food insecurity and disproportionate impact of environmental and climate change disproportionately impacts people of color and, and people, poor people. Um, tonight, we focus on the criminal justice system, but not in a large uh, macro way, but in the Amherst Police Department and what we control as a community. Um, and it's our, our opportunity to talk to the council about the Amherst Police Department. Um, I can tell you that the events that brought us here tonight uh, deeply trouble every police officer on the Amherst Police Department. I've met with almost all of them and that they are all very deeply troubled by the murder of George Floyd and feel that it was, it was a horrible event. Um, that being said, I am incredibly proud of our police department. It is superbly run, has very high professional standards, has a commitment to delivering the appropriate level of services at the, um, to the town as, and wants to align its service delivery with the needs and the desires of the town. And most importantly, the leadership, especially of the Amherst Police Department, is, has shown a willingness to listen, to learn, to change, and adjust. So you go to the next slide, Serge. So tonight, these are the topics that we will be focused on. We we'll want to talk a little bit about the mission, how the police department is organized, the training that the officers go through, how we operate the police department, the policies, that are in place, and then the accountability structures that are in place. And then um, this is a pretty comprehensive view of the police department. Um, typically, we would be inviting you or any members of the public for what we call ride-alongs to, to sit with police officers as they go about their daily chores. We cannot do that during COVID-19, um, but we hope to be able to open that up, up again, and the chief can talk more about that if he so chooses. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Livingstone and his team. So you go to the next slide, Serge. Thank you, Paul, and, and thank you, Lynn, for the opportunity to, um, to really talk tonight about the Amherst Police Department and you know, what we do as an agency. Um, Paul mentioned you know, he's very proud of the agency. Certainly, I am as well. You know, I've been a member uh, and you can see our, our team up here. I've been in the Amherst Police Department since I was 18 years old, um, 42 years of service. Um, you know, this is just gonna be, a, I think, a really great opportunity for us to kind of showcase what it is that we do as an agency uh, because 
so much of what we do, most of it isn't really about, you know, making arrests, making car stops. It's really policing has really changed over the years and certainly changed in the years since I've been a you know, young police officer about, you know, what we do as an agency and where we're going and um, how we've had to adjust. And those are the types of things that I, you know, I think we, I hope we get across to you tonight and certainly welcome the um, questions that'll probably come, but also about where we're going to, how we're going to move forward. I think, you know, I know Gabe and Ron and I have spoken a lot about wanting to see what the community wants out of the Amherst Police Department to see if there are things that we are, you know, doing that they would like change or things that we're not doing that we could be doing. So, you know, with that being said, you know, I've been here 42 years. Uh, well, you can see almost 100 years of, of service to the town of Amherst and, um, you know, very, very proud of our agency. So, Serge, next slide, please. You know, Paul touched on it briefly about what got us here. Um, you know, there was the really no other way of saying it, but um, from a police officer's perspective, disgusting display that we saw in Minneapolis. And prior to that, just many, many events that have got a lot of people questioning policing across America. And, um, you know, I, I understand the, the effect that it has with people because they'll Probably a lot of people don't understand how different police agencies are, you know, from, from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Arizona to a small agency like ours in Amherst. So, you know, we recognize how important this is to our community to uh, educate people about what we do and also to listen to everybody and, and take directives from the town council, take directives from our community about, you know, what they want out of our agency and what we could be doing differently. And, um, you know, in a very respectful, um, you know, and hopefully not a prejudging on either our part, part or the commun community's part, but just listening, communicating, and, um, and giving some information about how we are as an agency. So I'll move on. Next slide. This is our mission statement. This was a mission statement that we developed with community members back, well, probably in 2010 or 11, I think it was when I became police chief. We, we had a previous mission statement, but I just felt it was outdated. And so I tasked a few of our officers who reached out to some of our community members and you know, you can read it there. This is really the core of our agency and how we, we believe and what we stand for. And um, it's very, I would say very short, but very to the point and it really, um, talks all about what our agency is about. And, you know, we, we do value this community. You know, we love the community that we serve in. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're very much a family oriented police agency. Everybody here hangs out with each other. And, and we're, you know, we, we are very much a family in this police department. So uh, that's this mission statement is very, very important to the members of the Amherst Police Department. Serge, next slide, please. This is just in this, this is in our budget book, but it basically is just our, you know, command staff and, and you know, what, where we are and where we're spread out and what we oversee. So, um, you know, pretty basic, but it lists the number of officers that we have in each capacity and each function and um, who we're responsible for. Captain of Operations, Gabe Ting, oversees the patrol lieutenants and the sergeants who are on patrol. He oversees the parking enforcement people and the operational part of the patrol officers and Captain Ron Young oversees the administrative part um, and the detective bureau and that sort of thing. He oversees our records personnel while our, our one records personnel, civilian person who's very, very busy. Um, but you know, this is pretty basic stuff right here. Also um, part of our operations is the communication center where we have 12 civilian dispatchers Carol Hepburn as our animal welfare office. And um, we have one administrative assistant, uh, Michelle Matusko, who works on the second floor with Ron, Gabe, and I. So that's where we are as an agency. Serge, next slide. This is a breakdown of our, um, our department. We're budgeted at 48 officers. Um, we currently have 44 officers in the building. Um, we have three officers who are in an academy who haven't graduated yet, so they're not considered part of the department yet. Um, you can see the breakdown here is um, more specifically eight women, 
and, and 36 men. We have eight officers who identify with the minority group. Um, the degree of education part of our recruitment uh, process either mandate that an officer has a degree in higher ed or at least some military experience, one or the other, or a combination of both. So when we were in the recruitment process, we require that. So that's a little bit different than a lot of agencies that you might see, but it's, uh, I thought, uh, as we, you know, delve deeper into the, into the uh, process of recruitment and in, it, in a town like Amherst, which is really based and geared towards uh, education principle, we really thought it was important that our officers are, um, you know, have somebody with some degree of uh, higher ed. And then the um, median time of service, we're kind of transitioning to a younger police agency. And, and certainly if you were to weed me out of the mixture, it would be even younger than this. Um, but this is where we stand as an organization and where we stand as staffing levels at this current time, so. Serge, next, uh, next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn some different areas over to Captain Ron Young and to Captain Gabe Ting, but for um, Ron's expertise, I'm gonna turn the recruiting and training portion over to him and I'll be back with you guys in a little bit. Um, I'll just listen to Ron for now. Thank you, Chief. Um, you know, as we can see the dedicated I hear, um, our process is pretty extensive. Hold on, uh, hold on, Ron. Uh, Serge, can we figure out what the issue is with the garbling? We're going to ask everybody else to mute because sometimes that helps. Ron, can you try speaking once more? Can you hear me, Serge? I can. There's just okay. some distortion. On my end, Serge, do you believe? Yes. Do you by any chance have a have a pair of headphones or, or um, headset nearby? Actually, do. Serge, are you able to hear me now? Excellent. That's perfect. Oh, excellent. Very good. Terribly sorry about that, everyone. Um, you know, as the chief had, uh, had spoken about earlier, we, uh, we have a recruitment process that's pretty extensive. Um, our recruitment process is outlined by, by policy um, to make certain that there is a, a consistency throughout the process. So as we go from year to year, our recruitment it looks similar, or if we are if we happen to have to change it for whatever reason, like everything it evolves, um, we can amend that policy so that it would be consistent with what the strategies and kind of the mission of the police department is. Um, currently, our our recruitment process to put somebody on the street is just short of a year. Um, it takes about nine or ten months to actually get somebody interviewed, um, to get them vetted, uh, and ultimately get them trained at the basic recruit level. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit about what our recruitment uh, training looks like and then ultimately what happens to them after they get out of the academy. Um, we've developed here through our, our team, I have a lieutenant who's in charge of recruitment, some various strategies that we use in the community to try to get the best and the brightest to come to work here. Um, it involves reaching out to most of the academies and I mean, excuse me, the universities and colleges in the area. Just kind of a side note, my wife happens to work at a local university and she's the one who helped me in this area. Um, some of the, the various online and media postings that are that put us in touch with various job fairs um, to get us involved and get us exposed to some young people that may be interested in policing as a career. Uh, we do reach out to our military veterans. Um, we try to participate in the, the uh, Massachusetts Police Training Council's trainings across the state. We actually have quite a few instructors here in our agency and as a result, it allows us to be able to view some of the recruits that are out there and see whether or not they'd be a good fit for our community. Um, you'll note down there at the bottom of the slide that a number of years ago, probably three or four years ago, four or five years ago, we eliminated our entrance exam. Um, there was an attempt to try to be more inclusive to people in our community. 
who may have wanted to be involved or were interested in being involved in our agency as part of a career program, but felt a little intimidated about coming in and taking the exam. Um, that's kind of a, a step that I see a lot of larger agencies going through across the country right now. And I think it's probably a good choice. Um, we know that not everyone who would be a good fit happens to test particularly well. Uh, next slide, Serge, please. Um, once we've uh, once we've included, as the chief said, we have a criterion. Um, and once we've uh, assessed them, we we vet them through human resources, and they begin the process here. Um, we have a physical fitness assessment that we do internally. Um, that that physical fitness assessment is based on a set of uh, standards of across the country, and we use what's commonly referred to as the Cooper standard. We use the Cooper standard here to make certain that we have somebody's adequately prepared to to withstand the basic recruit academy. Following that, we have a series of interviews that they go through that begin with the staff. Uh, we form ad hoc committees here and we view human resources in that process and they're actually present and part of the, re the interview process. Once people have been vetted through that interview process, it goes to a secondary interview session that's typically manned by the chief and the town manager or somebody the town manager designates. Once somebody's given a conditional offer of employment, we put them through a very rigorous background investigation, which again is outlined by policy. Uh, the policy is very specific on what the background investigation will entail, and we specifically train people within our building um, on how to conduct those background investigations. Typically, a, a detective is assigned to that. I did them for a number of years, actually. Part of that background investigation is submission to a psychological exam, and that's, that's not done here in-house. We actually farm that out to a specific agency, whether in Boston or, or Worcester, so that we can get a complete psychological makeup to determine whether or not the person can be can be uh, a part of our team. And then the last the last piece of that puzzle is they have to be medically cleared. That's actually outlined in the statute and the uh, the Massachusetts general law requires that. Uh, next slide, please, Serge. So some of the challenges that we have here in our agency is that, uh, and again, this is not just unique to Amherst, uh, across, the, across the state and in fact the country, the, the economy which was strong up until the last six months or so made it difficult to recruit. Um, there are a lot of people that were coming out of college that had a lot of opportunity. Um, and that kind of watered down some of the typical recruiting pools that we had in the past. Particularly, we saw that with military folks, that the people that had been, had been active duty have gone on to various stages in the private sector, and we would typically recruit people from that. Right now, we're expecting here in this agency probably three or four, three or five, three to five people, th three or four most certainly that within the next year to 18 months are going to retire. Um, and those, as, as the chief said, we are in fact getting younger, but it's a slow process. Um, there are still some people, as the chief said, I'm, I'm a little long in the tooth myself in the deep autumn of my career, and I'm going to be one of those people in the next couple of years who are going to, uh, who's probably going to hang it up. And as a result, um, we have to start thinking about that and planning strategically for that. We also have found that in policing, again, not just in here in Amherst, but across the country, that, that a lot of the young people that come out that come into policing, they don't typically stay as long as someone is, you know, as Gabe has or as the chief has, that they will move on to other ventures. Um, Amherst is a great community. I love it here. Um, it's probably the greatest decision I ever made was to come to work here. And that makes it a really, uh, really challenging place to work. But there's a lot that are, we offer. We have a lot of growth opportunity. Um, you can be involved in a lot of different things here in our agency, and that makes it very attractive. It's a professional agency. We are the gold standard. And um, just about anybody who you, who you deal with in the policing community across Massachusetts always refers to Amherst in terms of what we do and the commitment that we have to our, our agency as well as to our community. It's a unique community, but that's what makes it um, really just a great place to work. However, with that, there are some disadvantages. It is a challenging place to be a police officer. Um, our agency by design demands a lot from our officers and the community demands a lot from us. Um, and that keeps us on our toes, but it does make it challenging. It's a high visibility agency. A lot of people have their eyes on us. Um, and as a result of that, it can be complex to be a police officer here. I, I see that as an opportunity myself, but it is tough sometimes if it's not a right fit. Uh, Serge, next slide, please. So just to touch on some of the training, the chief mentioned this earlier, and I kind of began it when we were talking about recruitment. 
once we have actually selected somebody and, and provided a conditional offer of employment to them, they must attend the basic recruit academy that's outlined by statute. That academy is held here in Massachusetts at one of the five major academies across the state. It takes about 26 weeks or about six, six months to complete. Um, following that, again, mandated by, by policy, we subject somebody to a field training process here. Um, it's a very, it's a very unique product. We just actually redid, redid the process and revamped it about a year or so ago. That is about 14 weeks in length. That field training process involves field work, it involves policy review, it involves um, physical fitness assessments and so forth. It's pretty comprehensive and it is designed for the recruit officer to be able to, for us to be able to assess to determine whether or not recruit officer is going to be um, released on his own. So they have some form of autonomy as a police officer. We have in fact utilized this process in the PAC to, to determine whether or not somebody is not a good fit and they've moved on, but it is, uh, it's, it's challenging. Um, once, once that police officer is, is autonomous, is out on their own, we're required annually to provide additional training. Again, that's outlined by statute. We uh, provide 40 hours of training annual at, at a bare minimum. That's, that's basically what the, what the, the, the uh, law requires. And then after that, we have some additional training. We have elective training, um, which typically is about 16 to 18 hours per officer. And then we have additional specialized training that occurs based on what the needs of the agency are, what the career development is for the officer, and some of the other things that maybe they began in the last fiscal year for training needs. A lot of police training is sandwiched on or, or is, is piled onto training that we had in the past. We also have some very good career development opportunities here. Uh, we have a number of officers that teach uh, both at the uh, state and court level. Um, we have officers that instruct at various police agencies um, and actually a couple of us that um, teach at some of the local colleges and universities. Uh, next slide, please, Serge. So just a sample of what an in-service training would look like. Again, the mandate is by the state. The, the Massachusetts Police Training Committee sets the annual in-service training every year, and we're required to follow that, and we do, in fact, follow that. Typically, it involves a legal update. Um, it doesn't mean that we only do legal update once a year. We have a SharePoint that shares local case case law review at the state level, and then also federal case law that pops up. We use, we use this opportunity once a year to go through those changes. Um, last year was a, an excellent example of that with the, with the sweeping changes as part of the Criminal Justice Reform Act. Um, we do use of force training. Um, we do that at least biannually, sometimes more than that. That involves a variety of different things, most notably reviewing our departmental policy, um, hands-on based scenario training. We do a lot of very dynamic type training. Um, obviously, right now, one of the things that's discussed across policing is de-escalation techniques. We've been training that for a number of years. Um, I just randomly pulled out a training file that I had from 2005 the other day, just randomly out of a folder. We're, we're going through some de-escalation techniques that were scenario-based, um, that were outlined and, and very well scripted. It was actually an excellent training, and I remember it. And then some response trainings that we do at, at least annually, CPR, first responder, we train with naloxone um, for people who have uh, opiate, uh, opiate overdose issues. Uh, next, please, Serge. And this is just a snippet that I pulled off of some of the specialized trainings that we, that we attended over the last uh, couple of years. Um, you can see them noted there. We try we tried to offer a variety of different things to our officers over the, every year not only to keep the training fresh, but also to make us relevant to what we do. Um, one of the things that you'll note there that it was kind of an interesting training was this trauma-informed interviewing. And I, I can talk about that a little later on, but you know, we've learned a lot in policing over the last couple of years of just the impact that trauma has on people that, that are involved with the, with the police, whether as, as a suspect or, a, or somebody who has been victimized yet again. Uh, next slide, please, Serge. Uh, training review. All our training has to uh, be approved actually by me. Um, there has to be a written lesson plan. I must review it before we actually put it in place. I want to make certain that the training is measurable, um, that, that it's something that's going to be our agent, what our agency needs. Is it going to be effective? Are we actually going to reach all of our officers? Is it something that we can do? Is it something we can afford? There are a lot of different variables. We keep training files here forever. Um, we, the idea behind it is that we can go back and see whether or not training has improved. 
quite frankly, sometimes we have to revisit it just because the turnover. So we will go back and look and see whether or not something that we did 10 years ago, do we need to do again? Is it even relevant any longer? We review our training frequently, but uh, at, at, at least annually, um, we put together an ad hoc committee that usually is involved of line officers as well as command staff to talk about what our training look like and what it's gonna look like for the coming year. Uh, the chief is approved of, and we keep a written policy here in our organization that's used to not only maintain and organize what our training is, but to mandate training for the future. Uh, Serge, next slide, please. And uh, at this point, we're gonna talk about the accreditation process and what it's done for us as an agency. Uh, Gabe Hitt was a long time accreditation manager within the agency, and he's probably better suited to present that for the group. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Ting. So I am the captain of operations here at the Amherst Police Department. And for this first slide, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission and what that means for us, for our agency. Uh, just to give you uh, a little bit of history, there are two forms of accreditation. Um, one is a federally funded, which is, uh, the acronym is CALEA. You're gonna hear a lot of acronyms that we utilize because the, the titles are really long. Uh, CALEA is a Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. Again, it's federally funded. MPAC, which is the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission, that's a state-funded agency. Um, we have chosen to go through MPAC simply because it's a lot more stringent and it's directly in line with Massachusetts agency and it's certainly more comprehensive. So, um, MPAC started in 1996 and was created to professionalize and standardize police agencies to the highest degree to promote best practices, accountability, and transparency. And out of 357 police agencies in the state, 85 agencies are accredited since 1996. Uh, our police department here became the second fully accredited agency in the state in 2001. Amesbury was the first. Um, so for accredited agencies, uh, in order to attain it, you must adhere to 257 mandatory standards and at least 50% of 125 optional standards. And what are those standards? Those standards are, are a review of our use of um, our policies and procedures and rules and regulations and basically the systems that we have in place for our police department to operate. Um, so, so far we have been assessed uh, six times successfully. Um, and uh, basically uh, every three years, um, a commission of, made up of assessors that are within our peers will come to our agency and they will conduct that assessment and they review all of our policies, our procedures, and they try to determine if we satisfy all of the commission's uh, requirements to become accredited. Um, we're very proud of the fact that we have four officers within our agency that are state assessors as well. Um, so who is on our MPAC team? So currently Captain Young, who's our administrative captain, he oversees the program, um, but we usually designate a Lieutenant to, the man to be the manager. And I was uh, the previous manager and now Lieutenant Daly is the current manager. And what his job is, is to maintain all records and the progress of the process. So currently we also incorporated uh, a detective sergeant as well as a detective to assist in the process. But ultimately all supervisors are involved because um, when we review all of our policies and procedures and rules and regulations, we're constantly making sure that they're up to date. Every single supervisor will review the specific policies that are within their wheelhouse. Um, in terms of the program benefits, it really it provides a norm for an agency to judge its performance, provides a basis to correct efficiencies before they become a public problem, requires agencies to commit their policies and procedures to writing, uh, it promotes accountability among agency personnel, provides a means of independent evaluation of agency operations for quality assurance, and it enhances the reputation of the agency and promotes public confidence in the agency. And every three years, when it's time for an assessment, we do publicize it to the public. Um, we do ask for public input, because that's a time when our agency is fully being examined and analyzed. Um, so we ask for direct input from everyone. Uh, next slide, slide please, Serge. So, 
So what we do, um, you know, we are a 24-7, 365 day a year operation. Uh, we pride ourselves on sending an officer to every call that, that comes in. Uh, even for a call that doesn't necessarily require an officer's presence, such as a report of a damaged mailbox, let's say, um, we feel that we still uh, should send an officer directly to speak somebody who's calling for our assistance. So aside from the current COVID-19 circumstances, we believe that any community member who calls for our services for any reason deserves an officer to show up in person, unless the reporting party doesn't feel comfortable in doing so. So our officer's mission is to assist someone directly or to find the right avenue in order to solve whatever the problem is. Uh, since our job is to be on the road and as first responders, we're usually dispatched all medical and fire calls as well. Uh, we will often be the first on scene to be able to assess the situation and to determine what resources are needed. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an explanation of what, uh, what our patrol functions look like, uh, we're minimally staffed with three patrol officers on the road, including one sergeant, so, so four cruisers that are on the street. Um, In-house, we also uh, require a station officer to maintain uh, the department. So our patrol division, their usual, their usual work hours are four days on and two days off, including holidays. And our uniform patrol division works uh, three distinctive shifts. So they work eight, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., 40 p.m. to midnight, and midnight to 8 a.m. And we also at times will incorporate a swing shift from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. Uh, in regards to our supervisors, uh, they, sh they share the same shifts, uh, but they also have some split shifts to make sure that we have enough coverage throughout the week. Um, during the academic months, we do require mandatory, what we consider no time off weekends. And we have a full complement of officers on duty, anywhere from five to seven officers on duty per shift. So uh, if there's a planned event, additional officers will be hired depending on the, on the needs of that event. Uh, during the academic season, those events are plentiful. Uh, the events may be anything from expected busy weekends to the Blarney blowout, the Hobart hoedown, or sanctioned events such as road races, uh, incoming students from the university, graduations, or town planned events such as the town fair, or lighting of the Merry Maple, or even the 4th of July fireworks, which we missed out on this year. Um, I just wanna to touch real, uh, touch upon uh, outside work details. I know a lot of people often have questions as to you know, what their function is when they see an officer on the street doing conducting traffic. Uh, state law mandates a police officer or a flagger on state roads to be hired when work needs to be completed while on a public roadway. Um, the schools often also hire police officers for, for details such as sporting events or traffic or security purposes. Even private citizens have the ability to hire officers for specific events. Uh, the compensation that pays for that officer uh, comes from the private entity, so it doesn't come from the town whatsoever. Um, some other functions within the department, we do have a detective bureau. We currently, ha currently have a detective lieutenant who's in charge of that unit, as well as a detective sergeant, and five detectives who each have their own specialties of training. So their function is to augment our patrol shift as a support system to handle complex investigations from deaths uh, to sexual assaults, child abuse, domestic abuse, arson, and complex financial crimes, just to name a few. Uh, in, terms of our, in terms of our administrative staff, that includes the chief, myself, and Captain Young. Uh, we work Monday through Friday uh, in the daytime from eight to four. So um, next slide, sir. Sorry, I'm just trying to follow along here. So our calls for service uh, used to be roughly around 20,000 calls per year. In the past five years or so, we have been averaging about 18,000 calls per year. Um, I, I would go back as far as to 10 years ago, our criminal charge rates would average about 1,500 uh, criminal charges per year. And now our criminal charge rates uh, in 2018 were 803 and it dropped, and in 2019 it dropped down to 644. So 
We attribute much of that to our outreach efforts and our ability to, to discern the difference from someone who's committing a crime versus somebody who's in mental health crisis. And I know we're gonna to touch a little bit upon uh, our crisis intervention team a little bit later. Um, the range of call types are endless though in our town. Uh, we get a taste of everything due to the diverse climate, the transient population of students, permanent residents, and people from all walks of life. Many of the issues that are at the forefront in Amherst are quality of life issues, homelessness, and unfortunately there's been a large uptick in mental health issues in the past few years. So what's kind of interesting is that each shift, um, you know, I mentioned the day shift, the four to mid shift, and the midnight to eight shift. Each shift has its own personality and all, they're all equally as busy, just in different ways. Um, essentially the day shift is usually centered on the comings and goings of the business district and the schools. Uh, the four to midnight shift transitions into the lives of people who are getting off from work and into the quality of life issues. From midnight to eight, the officers are usually dealing with more severe quality of life issues and crimes that are more serious or dangerous in nature. So our world is always changing and our agency is really no different. Uh, we're constantly adjusting and evolving to improve our methods to deliver the highest quality of service possible. The department used to be very heavy on reactivity. You know, we used to basically just wait till the call came and respond. However, over time, we realized that in order to really fix a problem, uh, we had to be a lot more proactive. We had to find solutions before it happens. So our, our proactive model had given uh -huh. rise to our outreach efforts, which we learned uh, that a commitment to educating the public and creating partnership was far more effective than just plain enforcement. So as our world is becoming more complex, so are our responses. We now spend more time on calls than we used to in the past, mostly due to investing the time to get all of our partners involved to solve a problem, utilize other agencies such as uh, UMass Student Life Office, Department of Children and Families, the Department of Mental Health, the District Attorney's Office, Clinical Support Options, Behavioral Health Network, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, just to name a few. So we try to get all of our partners in play to solve whatever the issue is at hand. Uh, next slide, please. So again, um, what do we respond to? Just about everything, you know, our town is really unique. We really get a taste of everything. We're fortunate we have the college community here, but we also have a permanent residency here of, uh, of about 40,000 people. So we really get to touch upon a little bit of everything. I'm gonna go into uh, some of our, our outreach programs in a little bit more in depth, uh, but certainly we have our, our DART, CIT, ALICE, KU, Adventure Academy, SEPTED, Ropes Challenge Course, RAD, and uh, a lot of our officers that coach athletics to try and reach the community in every aspect that we possibly can. Um, next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit about our, our, our community outreach officer. So Casey Nagel is our current community outreach officer. So the position we call the COO as an acronym, uh, uh, it's a result of a need to have an officer specific to the downtown area. So we saw a need to be able to provide the community a specific conduit to the police department through this officer. The idea is to make the downtown business district a welcoming place for all residents and visitors. The coup's primary concerns are any problems related to the downtown vicinity. Um, you can usually find Officer Nagel on bicycle or foot patrol in order to be more accessible and approachable. Um, the the coup position is also a member of several groups to help him uh, to be more efficient in that position. So he is one of our homeless shelter liaison members. He gets to know members of the homeless population to help them with their needs. From a public safety standpoint, for our needs, he provides information to other officers of what their, you know, what the homeless person's background, what their story might be, what their tendencies are, and if they're a danger or not. So that really helps us to be able to respond accordingly when we deal with a specific person. Uh, he's also a member of our drug addiction response team. So as a DART officer, he helps those addicted to heroin and other substances seek treatment with an alliance with Hampshire Hope of Northampton. He also connects with downtown organizations and business owners about the use of Narcan 
to help reduce uh, overdose fatalities in the town of Amherst. That has truly been a miracle drug. Uh, he's also a member of SPIFI, which is the Strategic Planning Initiative for Families for uh, Youth Coalition in Hampshire County. It was founded in 2002 and is a broad countywide coalition. It helps local communities reduce risk factors that make it more likely youth will engage in, in unhealthy behaviors while increasing protective factors that encourage your youth to make healthy choices. Um, he's also a member of our SEPTED team, which is crime prevention through environmental design. So his team attempts uh, to change our environment to help criminal activity uh, decrease. Uh, not through just uh, enforcement efforts, but just to kind of decide, hey, maybe this neighborhood might need a little bit more lighting. Maybe we need to cut down a tree to, to gain a little bit more visibility for traffic, things of that nature. He's also a ropes course instructor, uh, which we proudly have over at the, at the Notch Visitor Center. And that's something that we utilize quite frequently. We have um, countless groups that we use for, for bonding and team building. So in this position, he tries to use outdoor learning to inspire that team building and personal confidence. Um, so what's nice about uh, Officer Nagel is he's also a camp counselor for our annual Amherst Police Adventure Academy, which we hold for Amherst kids. And that gives us an opportunity to get to know the future of this town. Um, and in return, they have a, uh, an opportunity to get to know what it's like to be a police officer and what it is that we do. We also coordinate with the University Police Department for that Adventure Academy. Um, we also have three uh, homeless shelter liaisons with the addition of Officer Nagel, we have two more. Um, so what their position really entails is they are a direct conduit to the homeless shelter and while the homeless shelter is in session, they go there every single night. They check up on the guests that stay there. They check up on the staff that are there. They get to know all the homeless uh, members that are staying over there. It's been really beneficial because they develop a strong relationship with these people and they kind of, they find out what their background is and what their needs are. And they're able to help develop a plan to try and get them to where they need to be. Um, so they help them with their medical needs, with their addictions and their mental health needs. So these liaison officers are a great source to help the rest of the department to make determinations on who's committing a crime versus someone who's having a mental health crisis. So the familiarity becomes the department's familiarity, which in turn helps responding officers make the correct decisions. So um, our role when dealing with someone in crisis really is, is Pretty simple, you know, when somebody's in crisis, you know, our function as a police officer when we respond is to make sure that they don't harm themselves and they don't harm others. Uh, once we can establish that the scene is safe and that person's in a safe place, we usually direct them to a higher level of care. Um, and again, I mentioned the partners that we have uh, when it comes to mental health programs, and we usually help to facilitate that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our neighborhood liaison officer, who's Bill Laramie. So this program uh, is part of our, our uh, department's outreach. So we recognize that there needs to be a change in how we work with our student population, which, is, uh, which creates a, a lot of problems within uh, the quality of life issues for our town. Um, in the past, we used to, the way we used to enforce student problems is, is trying to arrest our way through it. So we would basically use enforcement only as a deterrent. And over the years, we realized that that doesn't really work. Um, they weren't really getting the message and it was just a, a cat and mouse game. So we realized, you know, we really need to change our methods and try something different. So we incorporated our need neighborhood liaison officer who works directly with the university and the student population. So we decided to um, really empower the students to try and hold them responsible in, in an adult manner. We want them to participate as well. We want them to take part in being responsible members of our community because after all, uh, nine months out of the year, they do live in our town and they are part of this community. So our neighborhood liaison, he facilitates this by being a member 
of or working with the following organizations. He worked with the UMass Off-Campus Student Center, with Greek Life, Dean of Students at UMass and Amherst College, uh, the UMass Athletic Department, the Spiffy Coalition, um, the UMass PD, uh, certainly with our Town of Amherst Code Enforcement Office, rental property managers, property owners, neighborhood groups, uh, again, SEPTED, he is a member of, and our CCC, which is our Campus Community Coalition to reduce high-risk drinking. And he came up with the creation of Party Smart Registration, which was a way for, again, for students to be able to uh, host a party responsibly. So our NLO's work has been tremendous in fostering a strong relationship with the university and its student body. Uh, due to his work, arrest rates have gone down, quality of life issues have decreased in terms of um, problems. Large day drinks last year have entirely disappeared from the entire year of 2019, which is, which is kind of strange and, and refreshing. Um, so the culture uh, is getting away from UMass being really a party school. Uh, the overall experience has been so productive and fruitful that our future plans are to expand our, our outreach unit uh, to try and take this to the next level. In addition, um, Officer Laramie has been a keynote speaker in several national level town gown trainings. His experience and expertise have become a national model where many large scale universities are starting to adopt and develop strategies based on Officer Laramie's work. Uh, next slide, please. So certainly what uh, the, structure, the structure that we utilize um, that help guide our department is uh, we're regulated by our policies, procedures, rules and regulations, certainly our training. And, you know, as, as Captain Young had touched upon, you know, our training is superior, in my opinion, to uh, any other agency in Western Mass. You know, that's something that our chief of police takes great pride in. Um, training is at the core of, of the foundation of our police department. Um, so other things that, uh, that we use to regulate um, how we work and our performance is our collective bargaining agreements and certainly our accreditation standards, uh, which we're very proud of. Next slide, please. So we do uh, maintain a comprehensive list of policies governing job performance and duties. Uh, some of the samples are in there. We have, uh, I think we have 99 policies right now um, that cover any, anything from arrest to criminal investigations, victims' rights, use of force, traffic services, training, records keeping. And of course, all of our policies are public records. So, you know, we, we invite every, everyone and anyone to take a look at our policies and, um, you know, certainly uh, give input if, if you see as necessary. Next slide, please. So Amherst police officers receive guidance and mandates, not just from our policy, but certainly from our mass general laws that we have to follow, uh, as well as federal case law, IACP and PERF recommendations and guidelines, our town bylaws, um, certainly the training that we have, and we do follow the six pillars that are outlined from President Obama's guidelines for the 21st century policing. Uh, next slide, please. So specialized equipment. Um, so all the equipment that, that our department uses is considered as defensive weapons, hence the term defensive tactics. Uh, it's against our use of force policy to ever use any techniques or weapons in an offensive manner. Uh, the specialized equipment that we own is a culmination of years of incidents arising experience and research. Um, for example, in the spring of 2003, uh, our entire department was ordered in on a Saturday to deal with the annual Hobart Hoedown, which used to be a huge unsanctioned uh, spring party at the end of the year for university students. And they would invite all their friends um, and they would descend on Hobart Lane in North Amherst for the last big party. So on that night, by close to nightfall, most of our department was dismissed prematurely, you know, really due to a lack of activity. There were a lot of kids around, but just not a whole lot going on. Uh, so that left about 15 officers that were on patrol that night. 
so there were still thousands of students that were out and they were just milling around, but um, there really wasn't too many issues until a fight broke out on Hobart Hoedown, which, um, you know, just a mob of people gathered around to watch that fight. So as soon as the officers tried to intervene, uh, the crowd turned on the police and they began throwing rocks and beer cans and whatever they could find at the police. So, you know, I was there that night, we were grossly outnumbered and we really lacked a lot of tools. We didn't have any riot gear to protect ourselves. We didn't have any any type of less, le less than lethal weapons to try and uh, mitigate the situation. So for hours, we would just march in the, in the streets trying to uh, make the mob dissipate. And uh, so from that night, many lessons were learned. We realized that we were really ill-equipped to deal with these large scale events. Um, we needed a tool that could be less than lethal, that was effective and that could provide a, a longer range. So we discovered the pepper ball gun, which uh, delivered all of those qualities. So the gun itself is really no different than a pepper ball gun that your teenage child might be interested in. The difference is, is that it's equipped for um, police usage. Uh, the difference is, is that the projectiles that are contained within, they contain a pepper component that's, that's utilized as an irritant. So that irritant is not long lasting, it usually lasts for about 45 minutes and then it dissipates in the air. Um, doesn't present any long-term effects and the pepper's really the same. It's the same as the pepper spray canisters that the officers carry and certainly it's the same um, pepper that any ordinary person can purchase over the counter for personal protection. So since, there, since then there have been several years when there was at least one riot per year, certainly at UMass uh, that we would assist with and then development of the Blarney blowout came around um, so certainly we've been really thankful to have these tools. Uh, we utilize them for area denial to prevent people from going into an area where we don't want them to be in. So we never use any direct targeting techniques, uh, which means we never shoot at the people. Um, the rounds are always skipped off the ground or shot above a, above a building to allow the irritant to kind of drop down for that area denial. Um, another, uh, item that we utilize is the expandable baton. Uh, it's expandable because it's simply easier to carry on an officer's tool belt. We used to carry a, a long stick, which was really cumbersome and the optics of it just isn't that good carrying a stick like that. Um, so this tool again is used defensively for controlling techniques or to be deployed when someone who is actively assaultive. Uh, we don't, and in terms of military grade weapons, that's something that we don't, we don't possess any, and we don't subscribe to uh, any military surplus giveaways. So in terms of um, tear gas, we don't have any, and we never will. We also do, we don't, we don't use any rubber bullets. Um, I know there was a, a proposal for, or discussion on tasers. Um, so we've looked into that in our department, certainly when we uh, saw an uptick in the rise of mental health uh, cases, you know, we kind of looked at, uh, tasers as a force option is that something that we really wanted to get involved in. Uh, we consulted our resident experts, which is our defensive tactics as instructors. And um, at this point in time, we saw that it's probably not a good idea for our department. It's not really fitting. Uh, Abe, you just froze. Um, so looks like looks like the chief uh, went went to to get him going. Um, Serge, why don't we go to the next slide, and I will uh, I'll take it over until we get him unfrozen. Froze. Okay. Can you hear me oh, now? Yep. You're good to go now, Gabe. Okay, okay. I'm back in. I, I'll just finish this portion in terms of tasers. No, they're not always reliable, simply because um, the 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 prongs can't always penetrate thick clothing or winter clothing. Uh, seeing that we're a northern state with uh, a lot of, we're uh, um, a cold weather state, so it can really only be effective during certain months. Also, there's there's a huge amount of liability that comes with the use of tasers. Um, in our in our opinion, the optics of using it is just really not that good. Uh, on top of that, the training would have to be extensive to be able to differentiate from utilizing a taser versus a real gun, and they're expensive. Um, the amount that will be used, that they would be utilized, uh, may not 
justify the cost. So overall, at this point in time, um, we're not sure if our community is the right place for it. Um, so that's something to be discussed down the line if, if uh, somebody wanted to see that taking place. Uh, next slide, please. So what does a typical officer do? Um, in our police department, a typical officer will patrol in a vehicle, a bicycle, a motorcycle, or on foot patrol. Um, the equipment that we utilize uh, for your ordinary patrol officer, they wear a ballistic vest, they have a radio, they have their, their sidearm, extra magazines, handcuffs, expandable baton, OC pepper spray, a tourniquet, um, and a flashlight, which amounts to about 25 to 30 extra pounds of gear that they have to carry. Uh, in their patrol vehicles, they're equipped with a MDT, which is a computer, um, a radio fixed cruiser cam, first aid bag, an automated external defibrillator, flashlight, flares, medical blankets, cones, crime scene materials, stop stick, a patrol rifle, a shotgun, and their personal bag with maps, ticket books, law books, gloves, um, COVID-19 mask, writing utensils, coffee, and their lunch. Um, so really a typical Amherst police officer is assigned a permanent sector for the duration of a six month bid. There are three sectors in Amherst. It's broken up to uh, the north, center, and south, according to the geography of the town. In the past, officers were just assigned to any sector with no rhyme or reason. Uh, years ago, our department realized that we needed to be able to provide the public with some more consistency, uh, to have an officer within their sector or neighborhood that, that could really become familiar with that officer and the officer could be familiar with the neighborhood. We realized that the officer would also become, um, would be able to deliver a higher quality of services with that familiarity. So the sector-based policing model was a foundation that kind of led to our community policing model. Uh, within the patrol, there are several officers from different shifts assigned to each sector along with supervisors. So this provides some additional buy-in from the officers to be responsible for, for really what happens in their designated area. All the officers from within one sector are able to communicate the problems that rise uh, in their sector and to discuss solutions from one shift to another. Uh -huh. So the model has been highly successful. Uh, with the incorporation of our outreach efforts, each officer becomes even more intimately involved with their area rather than aimlessly patrolling with no objectives in mind. Instead of what people would call random patrol, we wish to incorporate purposeful patrol. Um, in each shift, officers will know what issues are popping up in their sector, whether it's a noise issue or a traffic issue or breaking and entering or, or whatnot. So in each day, they will have a specific task to handle instead of just sitting there waiting for the call to come in. Um, when an officer responds to any call, we consider every situation an investigation. So the officer has a responsibility to gain knowledge of what the crime or the problem is, um, their duty is to assess the situation and then make a determination of what resources are needed or what investigative steps are needed. So they determine if there's a solution or a suspect, and then they put a plan into place to resolve that matter. Uh, so that's really typically what um, what an Amherst police officer uh, does on a typical day. And I'm gonna, for the count, next slide please. Thank you, Serge. So I'm gonna kick this back to uh, Chief Livingstone to talk a little bit about accountability and community feedback. So thanks, Gabe. And um, we're getting kind of towards the end, so I'll I'll try and get through this relatively quickly so that we can get into the second part of, of this, um, this meeting as far as um, questions and that sort of thing from town council. But on this slide, accountability and community feedback, um, you know, the, the feedback part, I think we've got the accountability down pretty well, you know, based on our policies and procedures and, and how we uh, keep track of what officers are doing and what officers training looks like. The community feedback, maybe not so much. Um, you know, Gabe mentioned that we were looking to expand our, our community outreach officers from the successes we've had with our campus community. 
um, and we're going, we were looking at um, expanding that to incorporate a lot of the successes there with other parts of the, our community, you know, citizens and, and people who are feeling quite frankly left out or not involved in, in their police agency. So, you know, we really mean it when we're gonna be welcoming what the community is looking for from us and what types of policing initiatives they may want. So, you know, moving forward, you know, that's gonna be part of the core of what myself and, and I hopefully the town council will be um, part, of, part of, but, you know, specific to accountability. So, you know, complaints, we got a lot of questions specifically on our Web page, you know, everybody could find out where you could commend an officer, but it was a little bit more difficult trying to find out where complaints may be able to be filed. So we worked with our IT people and made changes and we can continue to make changes to our website um, so that things are just easier for people to find, whether it's policies or being able to make a complaint about anything regarding the department. And those complaints can currently be found online in our, at our website at amherstpd.org, but also through the Human Rights Commission and through the town's manager's office. And we kind of thought it was, we just assumed that everybody knew that you could find the information there. And we quite frankly found out that people didn't know that. So, you know, that, that message needs to get out there and it needs to be out there more strongly. Um, if a complaint is filed, you know, everything is investigated, even if it's an anonymous complaint. Um, I think Captain Young mentioned that that process starts either with he or I with the complaint process, and then we, we started an investigation. Um, many, many times, um, somebody will come, come in to complain about, you know, why they were stopped for a traffic violation. And sometimes it's as simple as having a verbal conversation with people. But if somebody's not happy with that, we encourage them to go through the more formal process of taking out a police, uh, police com complaint form and going through that process. Um, as far as individuals who are, uh, want the more formal process, you know, we want them to be part of the investigation, so we encourage them to participate. Um, you know, we try and get them to stay with the process for the entirety of that investigation. Um, once the investigation is completed by our agency, um, I offer to meet with all the complainants if they choose to, just to give them, um, you know, a synopsis of what happened and what, why we do or why we did things that we do. Um, and if it involves officer corrections, we make them aware of that as well. So it gives, um, in the end, it gives the opportunity for a complainant to feel more, um, I guess, happy about the process that they've been uh, involved in. And for the agency's perspective, it gives us the opportunity to gauge training initiatives or if officer corrections need to be made, you know, those are the types of things that we consider for that. So, Serge, next um, slide, please. So these are just pledges that are kind of at the core of what our agency is about and uh, are important to us. But um, in this, this process tonight is just really the start for our community. Uh, I know our officers, and, and it starts with my office and myself, uh, remind, remain com committed to this, this community. I mean, I've been here for 42 years. I love the town of Amherst. There's a reason I've stayed here for so long. Um, it's a, just a great, great community to, to, um, to work in and be in. So with that being said, you know, we, we are committed to progressiveness and professionalism, you know, again, uh, I think, um, you know, our, what we do with our training, what we do with our policies and accreditation process kind of uh, proves that. Um, we totally want to hear from our community. We want to hear from our town council members about, you know, what they're happy with and if there's something they're not happy with. You know, we want to hear about that as well. So, um, you know, all of our officers are aware that this process is taking place. Um, they're invested and, um, you know, they're they may be watching from home. They may be watching, you know, downstairs um, to see what's going on. But, um, you know, this is a part about learning and listening, really, is what it comes down to. So, um, Serge, next slide, please. So, we knew that um, there were going to be a lot of questions that we, or we felt we were going to be able to answer a lot of questions about the agency and just a quick overview of how we operate and what we really do. Um, we also got some specific questions that were, you know, given to us, you know, a few days ago. So we were trying to answer those as well. 
And, and these were some of the specific questions that we wanted to make sure that we kind of covered. You know, understanding that we're not going to get to them all tonight, and there's probably going to be a lot of them coming down the road um, with future meetings uh, as well. But, um, you know, a lot of what's been talked about lately are our use of force policies, including reporting the use of force. So, you know, our use of force policy, and uh, again, that's one of the ones that we made sure was more easily accessible in our website. Um, it's out there. Um, we encourage people to read it. If there are questions about it, get them to us. Um, you know, it is set in standards. It is set by law. A lot of what we do in the use of force policy, there, all the restrictions are based in law, what an officer can and can't do. Um, it's something that we go over and over and over again with police officers, almost it seems like at every training. So, you know, we review all the use of force issues on an annual basis. And it is also reviewed from our accreditation co committee um, every three years for independent review to make sure that we're doing what we say we are doing. Um, and by law, every incident of force has to be reported. Um, and again, we just review anything that has to do with a, with a use of force um, issue. So, um, and of course, anything that in involves the use of a firearm gets referred to the Northwest DA's office for an independent investigation and, and review regardless of what the injury is. You know, I can happily say that we try to go back as far as the records can, um, that we could as far as when I, quite frankly, I knew that there's a, never been an officer that's used a firearm since I've been here in 42 years. And we couldn't find any uses um, of an actual Amherst police officer firing a weapon, um, and which is good news. And, but uh, again, I guess I'm not surprised at that either. Um, next slide, please, Serge. Do we require de-escalation? A lot is being discussed about this. Again, that's the, pretty much the core of what our agency, how we operate. Um, you know, we, we teach and, and teach and teach de-escalation techniques. Uh, it's part of our use of force options and continuum. Um, it's based in law, it's based in the MPTC requirements, certainly in our written policies. And it's something that we just ingrain into the officers um, at every training opportunity that we can. Um, you know, it truly is the bedrock of the training and it, it does start at the academy level. And then it's just free and forced continually here in the Amherst Police Department. Um, you know, we talk about it in recent court decisions, whether it's criminal law update or, you know, in our dynamic trainings, um, scenario-based trainings that we do, role player trainings that we do, um, we incorporate it all. So um, next question, or excuse me, next slide, please, Serge. Uh, we got a couple questions about are our Civilian dispatchers, um, you know, all 12 of them, do they get specific training in how to deal or recognize mental health crisis? They do. Um, that's state mandated uh, as well as part of their training. Um, you know, I'm very, very proud of the uh, protocols that we have in place and, and where we have gone as an agency in dealing with individuals dealing with mental health. Um, it can get better. Certainly our crisis intervention team is unbelievable. Uh, I think we have 75% of our agency, our entire agency tri trained in crisis intervention models. So um, not quite at 100% yet, but close. Um, but again, anytime we have an incident where a dispatcher may recognize an individual who is su suffering from mental health issues or problems, um, we make sure if one's working and they usually are that somebody who has that specific training gets dispatched to that specific call along with a supervisor. So, um, Serge, next question or next slide, please. So, civilian oversight, a lot, lot of questions and discussion about that recently. Um, so, as far as policy review through our accreditation, there is civilian oversight for that. Um, you know, we incorporate civilians in the review of those policies specific to a local um, group of community members. We don't have that, but certainly I think that's where our discussion is going to go. Uh, quite frankly, I would welcome that. I would love for our 
members of our own community to have access and come in and discuss all of our policies and what they look like. And I'm sure there would be questions, but that's something that we kind of hope happens um, with our community is, is to have somebody to who, who's actively involved and being interested in what we do as an agency. So, you know, hopefully that will, that will evolve. Um, again, just getting back to any incidents of force with a firearm or a death or any kind of serious injury that gets turned over to the Northwest District Attorney's Office for investigation. So um, that would be, you know, a form of civilian oversight at the legal le level. So, um, Serge, next. So this is specific to uh, resident complaints and how they're collected and made available to the public and what accountability system is in place. So, you know, if, if there's a complaint received from an individual, um, you know, we encourage those individuals to meet directly at first and let, it could possibly be, be on the midnight to eight shift. So I may not be around or Captain Young may not be around, but they're, um, you know, they're encouraged to speak with whoever the supervisor is working at that time so that he can direct them to the proper channel to get that complaint heard and investigated. But if, you know, some people aren't comfortable coming to into the police station to complain about another police officer. So again, you know, those, that, the encouragement is that they would go through the town manager's office, the HR department or human rights commission. Um, they can do it anonymously. They can do it over the phone. They can do it in person. But, um, and then that would, that would begin the process of our internal discipline um, review and, and, and um, process. So. Um, there is some accountability, or excuse me, there is a system of accountability in our policies, but also the di discipline process, if there needs to be discipline, is part of our collective bargaining agreements with our police unions, and those um, are on the line as well. I, and I know they're um, online through the um, HR department as well. So if you needed to check what those, what, what was in it, the specifically in a police union contract, you can read that and see what's in there. So that's public record as well. Uh, Serge, moving on. Yeah, that's, I think that pretty much covers um, our slideshow. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions. Hopefully we can answer them all. Um, I know I wanted to touch base is kind of getting away from what our agency does specific to policies and procedures and what this slide show represented towards what our concerns are this year in particular, it was just announced recently that the University of Massachusetts is going to be opening uh, to some degree with um, online and distance learning, but that also means that we're gonna have a huge influx of students coming back to live both on the campus and certainly in our um, housing projects or rental properties across town. Um, I had some discussions to, earlier today and earlier this week with the um, head of the University of Mass Police Department. They have the same concerns that we do specific to COVID-19 and how we're going to deal with issues. Uh, we're having uh, the town manager and I had discussions this morning as well with other department heads about what that's going to look like and how we're really going to deal and, and um, how that's going to affect the Amherst community. Um, you know, just again, some of the things that we as police officers uh, are going to be dealing with uh, what looks like probably about five or six weeks from now. So, um, you know, more to come on that. And we're going to be getting additional information on about how we're going to be responding to specifics on COVID-19 when the students return for, the, for this educational year. So I think at that, um, I'll turn it back over to the town manager, to the town council president, and um, Ron, Gabe, and I can field questions or just listen in. There was one more slide for just so people can see it. It's probably oh. not urgent. But it's, it's not urgent. Was there Gabe or excuse me, was there Serge? Did I miss something? Yeah. Oh, yes, just for more information. Um, again, we've made a lot of changes to our um, our website lately um, based on information we were getting from the public, from the town council, from the town manager. So um, I expect that we're going to be make additional changes to our website, but um, you know, uh, these are areas where you can find additional information about how our operations work in the police department, who we are, 
and what we represent, what we have uh, uh, invested in the community. So, you know, these are all places that people can go um, to get additional information. So thanks, Serge. Paul, did you have any concluding comment at this point? Uh, first of all, let me say thank you for a very, very thorough presentation. Um, this presentation does appear in the packet and we have added the memo that came from me to the town manager, which pulled together the many things I've been hearing from the community and the council um, that we hope that this presentation has addressed many of them. We're going to now move on to um, comments from the council and questions. And um, when we get them, I will call on the person and uh, they will unmute. And I, the question is going to go directly to Scott Livingston, the Chief Livingstone, and then he will decide whether or not he or one of the other captains will address it or Tim Nelson if need be. Uh, the first question is coming or comment is coming from Melissa Brewer. Please unmute. Yes, thank, <clears throat> thank you so much for that incredibly thorough um, presentation. And some of your people are aware that I was lucky enough to be able to participate in a citizen police academy some years back. And so I'd heard some of the, a good bit of this information before, but hearing it now with my current lens is incredibly helpful. So thank you very much. One thing I wanna address, I think largely actually to the council president is I really appreciate that that document that that was really took a lot of time to put together comments from you know perhaps at least as many as 13 counselors plus the public is while it is an excellent document it actually doesn't cover at least 10 of the things I asked about and so I'm wondering where we're at process wise because I'm, I'm hearing a little bit from the chief that in response to town council concerns we're doing some things and I, I was unaware that the town council had directed through the town manager, the APD to do anything at this point. This is our first conversation. And so that felt a little odd. And then in terms of, I don't expect anyone, including the town manager or even the president to have to like respond to every one of my literally 20 questions in my responses. And I don't wanna spend our time on it tonight, but I feel like the questions that we turned in, just like the public's questions, that got uploaded to our packet should probably be sent directly to the police just so they know what kinds of other questions we've had i like i said i have no fault with this document it's excellent but it doesn't ask some of the specifics something as simple as the police stops committee we did used to have a police stops committee that's very different than an oversight committee but did we learn anything useful from it that's the kind of question eventually I'd like to have answered because I think it would inform as we go forward how we can make a committee more useful that was a town meeting created committee I don't know anything that ever happened because of it maybe helpful maybe not helpful and just so we can learn from those experiences so understanding what our next steps are when we leave here tonight and how we can communicate our very specific concerns you know, because we're not supposed to just call up the chief and say, here's my 20 questions, here's my 15 questions. How do we go from there? Uh, Alyssa, is there a specific question or two you would like to ask tonight and for the benefit of the public? I think <laughs> there are so many and, and so many were touched on. And I think that the police stops committee only from the standpoint that we were looking for demographic information associated from that. And if we found that successful, just so, just as we were just talking about town manager evaluations and forums and how we get people to participate, maybe police, the, the way we did that police stops committee was maybe helpful or maybe not helpful. And so that's something I, I just like to be assured that we'll talk about at some point in the future. And very specifically, since I'll try and limit myself to another one is um, it was mentioned the use and I don't want to use the wrong term but the word riot did come up in terms of not having that gear in 2003 and then later and there have been some concerns expressed all along that on the one hand we absolutely have to keep our officers safe and on the other hand what's the signal it sends to people visibly when they see people geared up to get them to go somewhere. And so just to get a sense based on all the extensive training that you guys do men and women do how do you feel like you strike that balance between keeping your people absolutely safe like you need to and 
the symbolism it has for people to see those riot shields and those helmets at an event. Yeah, yeah we recognized, um, well, first of all, when we, when we didn't have the equipment and then purchased the equipment, it was based on uh, police officer injuries. So we didn't have, used to have any of that equipment. And going back to the early 2000s, um, when we really started to see the large outdoor parties, um, that's when we started purchasing protective gear like that. And then as, you know, time moved on and the Hobart her hoedown turned into the Barney blowout, we also recognized that there was a, there was an entity of, of young people who really, that was a happening. So they, the, a party wasn't a party until the police showed up with protective gear. And we recognized that. So now we've changed our pro practices again so that protective gear like you talked about, whether it be helmets or shields, is not brought out unless absolutely necessary. So officers may have it in their cruisers, in their trunks, if there's anticipation of something bad might happening. And then previously, we would just show up with it and hang out and realize that wasn't the right thing to be doing. So because students did recognize that, hey, if we start something, maybe they'll react to something. So, you know, it was a learning lesson for us as well. So we've changed, um, we've changed how we do things specific to, to um, gatherings. Um, there was another question about the police stops committee. So, and I remember when Alyssa brought that up before, I'm not familiar with it. And I reached out to the previous chief and he couldn't remember it. So I'm gonna have to go back and, and maybe even get educated about what the purpose of that was for. And Alyssa, I don't know if you recall specifically, but um, I'm not familiar with what they're, they were tasked with. Okay, we'll get that information. Um, moving on, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Please unmute. Okay. Um, well, thank you for putting things in, in context. Uh, I had not realized you had so many officers. So that means that it's not, at least from where I live, they're not an obtrusive part of, of life here, which I appreciate. And I was unhappy to hear that you actually did have that riot gear, but I'm glad that you decided not to make shows of it. I think recently we've seen some really disgusting displays of military might um, in, in civic experiences. But I had one question. Uh, you, your answer on use of, of uh, firing a gun, um, first of all, that, there, that you have to go through the district attorney, and two, that you don't have a memory of it happening, that was very heartening. But I did not see any details here about use of physical force, and that's kind of how we got started on this particular round, which was to do with um, choke holds, knee holds, and, and that kind of thing. So I was just um, want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, your philosophy of use of physical force. So it's very specific when an officer can use um, any force for, for that matter, but specific to choke holds and, and knee holds and stuff, um, they're against the law. They aren't something that's been taught. Certainly not in this agency. They're not part of what we teach our officers and they've never been anything that we've ever taught police officers that they're allowed to do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's taboo in this agency um, and it's not allowed and it's never been taught. So. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dorothy. George Ryan. Yes, uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, and again, thank you to the chief and to uh, Captains Ting and Young for their presentation. I've got a, a couple of questions that I'd like to present if I could very quickly so we can get to the public. Um, first is has to do with use of force and how frequently these sorts of incidents take place. Um, in a given year, can you give us some sense of how many times you see these kinds of use of force reports come across your desk? Uh, are you talking in the tens? 20s, hundreds, yeah, just curious about that. I also have a question from a constituent about historical database. There are clearly, we can access daily reports. Does there exist a database the public can access that is historical over a long period of time related to police stops and arrests? So first, just a couple quick questions about use of force and any statistics there. And secondly, about database and whether there's a historical database that people can access 
uh, beyond just the daily reports? Sure. So specific to the stop data, yeah, we collect that and present a report annually. And people certainly can get that access. Um, Gabe, is that on our website as far as um, racial data profiling car stops? I know we have it, but I don't know if we publish it in our uh, website anywhere. It is not published, um, but that's data that's that's available. So certainly, um, you know, if somebody wants it, we can make that available. And, and then the second part of the question, Ronnie, was uh, the number of use of force incidents and. It can be anything from using pepper spray to um, a hand strike to a baton strike, that sort of thing. So. Yeah, so the Chief, the, uh, the answer to that is it's in the tens. Um, I, I can't give you a specific number for last year. We review each use of force uh, every January. We have a, we look at the last years because we're assessing it for training, for patterns of conduct, things of that nature. It's not in the dozens, it's, it's in the single digits more often than not. And if not, it's, it's, it's right in that ballpark. I, and that, all that is, is public record and I can produce that at any time, Chief. We keep, we keep track of it over, over time at Memorial. Thank you. Uh, Patty Angelis. Um, thank you, Ever. I, I wanna thank uh, the department and um, for the work that you do as a sister of a police officer I have an understanding of the kind of impact it can have on your personal life and on your own um, health. And um, I find that your commitment to the community is believable and um, I'm grateful for it. I do, uh, do want to say that uh, my friend Jackie Brown Hazard worked on the police stop uh, thing and it was activated by town meeting in 2004 and ended as inactive. Uh, in 2008. And the goal was to gather information about stops um, and the number, uh, the number of stops, the gender of the person stopped, and easily identifiable ethnicity of all vehicle occupants. And um, the last time we talked in a budget meeting, we didn't quite, it didn't seem like you had the information around uh, um, ethnicity. Uh, and we're concerned about that. Um, I, I want to get to two things, and, and somewhere in here there's a question or two. Uh, you talk about use President Obama's task force and uh, on 21st century policing and using that as a reference. That document, those guidelines call uh, for um, law enforcement agencies to collect, maintain, and analyze demographic data on all detentions, stops, frisks, searches, summons, and arrests, and most importantly, share that, actively share that with the community. It called for transparency um, uh, around that data. And also, the guidelines also call for the involvement of the community in the process of developing and evaluating policies and procedures and reviewing incidents. And so I, I got a sense as you spoke about some commitment to the community being able to talk to you. But from in these guidelines, there is very active citizen mm -hmm. oversight and management and design in collaboration with the police. And I'd like to get your um, reaction to that and also what you see as the positives of it or possibly the negatives of it. Sure, Pat, thank you. Um, from the perspective of police um, policies and community oversight, uh, I'm hoping that's kind of where we go forward with these meetings. And by that, I mean more specifically to our community um, because we do have civilian oversight, but it's at the state level. It's not at the local community level. And I'm kind of, I know Ron and Gabe and I are both, all three of us are hoping that uh, one of the developments that comes out of these discussions and these meetings are um, just that, um, getting the community and civilians uh, involved in, you know, regular meetings of what our policies consist of, what is it that we're doing that you may not like, and what is it that we could change and make things better. So, you know, I'm hoping that's where we're going with this. Um, you know, specific to the President Obama's task force on 
21st century policing, you know, they talk about the six pillars of, of um, 21st century policing. And I think we meet those standards in one way or the other. I don't think they're always as specific as they could be. Certainly we've got an awful lot of information and data that is accessible to the public, but maybe not enough. And again, I think that's an area we need to be probably more specific about where do you find this information? How do you access it? Um, that sort of thing. Yeah. Can I just interrupt for one second? Sure. More than accessing the information, uh, mm -hmm. the, the guidelines really call for having community members collaboratively design policy and procedures. And that's different than just having people get the information. And so how do you react to that kind of active involvement? So there's gonna be a, a, there's gonna be a degree of education if we get a, say for instance, we get a task force together to talk about that because a lot of our policy is based in state law. So we may not be able to do some things um, without getting some sort of legislative change perhaps, but I guess that's kind of what I meant, but because a lot of what our policies are based on are regulated by various degrees of law. Um, am I missing anything, Ronnie, in that you think? Really, the vast majority of our policy has been in existence for a number of years. So when President Obama first announced this initiative, we already had the existing policies. Um, most of them are based on what the accreditation standards were in 2002 when we first became accredited. And then they changed as those changed, quite frankly, as they evolved. I think what I think what the city council person is saying is, or town council person is saying is that we haven't incorporated, we, we've taken our existing policies and just kind of ridden with them. And while we have some oversight, the development portion of that was never committed to or, or sent to the community or involved the community. And, and I don't mean to paraphrase what you're saying, Madam, but I, is that is that accurate? That's part of it. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I just want to echo what the chief says um, that falls under my guys. I would welcome that. I would love to have somebody part participate in that. It would give a fresh set of eyes. A lot of what we do, um, the accreditation requires us to do, but there is some flexibility in what we do as well. And quite frankly, if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, if it's not meeting what the community standards are, we need to work on that. And I can be part of that wellfully. Got any other comment? Not right now. Okay. Thank you. Steve Schreiber. Hi. Um, I was wondering if the chief had any opinion on three bills that are being considered by the state legislature right now. So I'm going to actually read these off an email that the ACLU sent. So one is called the Act to Save Black Lives, and it rewrites the rules for the use of force, and it enacts serious consequences for misconduct. Another one is an act to secure civil rights. This bill would remove qualified immunity from Massachusetts law and allow victims of police brutality to hold officers accountable for civil rights violations. Mm -hmm. And the last one is a face surveillance moratorium. It would immediately pause government use of face surveillance. So just wondering if there's any, any comments opinions that sure, I'll take them in reverse order Steve because it's um, the surveillance the face recognition surveillance thing is an easy one for us it's not an area that we're looking to we, we were not looking to go into um, as far as that's concerned uh, and I know there was some um, discussion already about um, potentially a, a bylaw that pr would prohibit that we're fine with that um, you know, I don't think that's going to affect or inhibit our ability to do our policing as, as we are currently doing. So I don't see that as an issue, certainly not from our agency, if that were to move forward with it by law. Um, I did get a chance to start reading the, um, the House and Senate measures today. It was sent to me this morning, as a matter of fact. I think it's 75 pages long. Um, you had specific ones about police certification and where that may lead us. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think there needs to be a system in place where officers receive some sort of annual, I think I think they were gonna do it a three year certification process. I think it should be annual. Um, uh, there should be mechanisms in place to be able to weed out officers who aren't behaving properly. Um, you know, I, 
look at agencies that are attached to the civil service process and what a disaster that is. Um, just trying to, you know, from a police chief's perspective, hand out discipline or training measures and stuff. It's it just, it's a mess. And so I think this would go a long way in correcting that uh, and then moving forward with a post system where, you know, officers are all held to the same standards. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, trying to remember what your last one was specific to. It rewrites the rules for the use of force and enacts serious consequences for misconduct. Right. And violent police tactics like tear gas, rubber bullets. Yeah, I saw, yeah, I saw that the, there was a section in there about, um, you know, tear gas and um, canines and how that would be affected. You know, the tear gas one is an easy one. Again, it's especially with this agency, but I, I think there needs to be regulations that are that are statewide so that all agencies are abiding by the same um, rules, so to speak. Um, you know, we've never used tear gas. Uh, I've been subjected to it in the past. It's not pleasant. Um, I don't see the need for it from a professional standpoint. So, you know, I get where that's coming from. Thank you. You're welcome. Challenge of Milne. Yes. Um... Thank you so much for your presentation today. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, um, maybe you're familiar with the APCON wait list, and it's not what we're hearing from you today. It seems like we very much do um, ad adhere to that list, but could you just confirm that uh, we, we don't do any of those things? Can, can you confirm that? Yeah, I can confirm that. Um, Matter of fact, most of what's on that list, we have, a, you know, we've followed those protocols for many, many years. Um, we never called it the eight can't wait. Um, I knew that was a, a new term, but when we were reviewing it. The captains and I were like, we've never done chokeholds. We've never allowed it. And we went right down the list and we're like, all of these are part of our policies already. So it was very, very simple for our agency to abide by it. Excellent. Good to hear. We can let people know about that in our town that we at least we got can. that down. Yes. Uh, the second question was like, I heard that you do a lot of outreach mm -hmm. in like the adventure camps with kids. And I was wondering what is the turnout for those things and how can people, how do people hear about those? So we used to always list it um, on our website and did a lot of just publications and flyers and that sort of thing when we in, began those camps. I think 20 years ago, we started those initiatives with, mm. a, um, and it was a one week camp where we took uh, kids from Amherst. It was specific to Amherst kids. Um, they never, it was free. Uh, we paid for it from the grant. And then when we lost the grant, we just continued the, the camp and we incorporated University of Mass in that with that. And it's, it's a week long camp. It was so popular that we had to turn people away and we were actually considering doing consecutive weeks of camp um, and then COVID hit and so we, this year's camp had to be canceled unfortunately I know it's one that our cops like as much as the kids like it's an opportunity for police officers to basically just go hang out um, it's very very specific to half the days divided up into what does a police officer's life look like and then the second mm -hmm. of the day is mostly just goofing around, having fun, going to swimming pools, mm -hmm. into our ropes adventures camp and doing mm -hmm. uh, team lean learning procedures and stuff like that. But um, no, it's, it's basically just a fun week for kids. Yeah, no, I think that's really important to have that sort of outreach and building relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last thing was, um, what percentage of the calls do you, do you know are for crisis intervention and crisis management? Mm -hmm. and what are some of the best practices we come in and yeah how can we improve that is that something you'd like to continue doing or do you feel oh, yeah. that could move for to or you know uh, to, to having a dedicated line or something that is handled by specialists sure um, I'll probably turn this answer over to Captain Young because that's really his expertise and he was part of the he was the original grant writer, how we got this crisis intervention team going. So mm -hmm. I'll 
that question uh, response over to him. Thank you. Certainly. So percentage I don't have for you. I can give you uh, the number of calls that we responded to last year. Mm -hmm. So my notes here say that in, it, it's been very consistent over the last three or four years. We responded to 362 calls for people in crisis last year. Mm -hmm. And then coupled on top of that, we conducted 107 follow-up calls, which were self-initiated mm -hmm. calls on the part of our agency. So about 500 calls per service, and that's been very consistent the last three, four, five years. Um, so CIT, the, the way we do it, we, we practice the Memphis model. There are a variety of different nationally recognized models. The Memphis model was actually driven from tragedy. Um, there, was a, there was a young person who was shot by the Memphis police officer who was suffering from a behavioral health issue. Um, and that port version of CIT came from that tragedy and it's one of the reasons that we practice it here. Um, CIT, just so as not to confuse matters, we're not clinicians. We don't pretend to be clinicians. We don't masquerade as clinicians. We don't purport mm -hmm. ourselves to be clinicians. Really what it does, it kind of bridges the gap between crisis response and getting people connected with people who can have long-term health concern uh, effectiveness. So we've bonded with CSO, Clinical Support Service, Clinical Support op Options in Northampton, as well as the Behavioral Health Network, BHN down in Springfield. Um, we, it, it allows us to connect with them, whether it's something like veterans issues, as I said, mental health recovery, behavioral health issues, um, uh, de-escalation process in the training that they provide for us. The, the CIT officers that are, are trained have to go through a 40 plus week program um, and they cover all of those items, things like human rights and stigma, um, law enforcement education, how to, you know, autism awareness type things, uh, mm -hmm. trauma, trauma informed interviewing process, de-escalation techniques, and just basically what these various clinicians bring to the table. Um, again, we don't try to solve people's problems. We try to assist. Um, mm -hmm. Our follow-up process, usually that follow-up involves people who are, have been involved or are seeking, you know, our assistance in that area. And sometimes with our DART program, it involves like aftercare type calls. Mm -hmm. um, we, we provide access to people um, who are looking for recovery coaches or maybe access to naloxone, Narcan. And so some of the follow-up is involved with that because we kind of don't always disassociate behavioral mental health calls um, with people that might have, um, that might have uh, substance abuse issues, or substance abuse uh, disorders. Does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You're muted, Lynn, but I think you were calling on me. I am, and thank you, Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, no, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, you know, it's it's good to hear for some of the items that we asked that our department does not um, engage in some of these use of force techniques um, and has very few force um, complaints um, and use of force reports where force was actually used. Um, but I still have some concerns. Um, when you have so few complaints, that's a good thing, obviously, um, but it makes it hard to really determine um, whether implicit biases or any biases of officers are actually being shown through on, on calls. And um, so I'd like you to address, you know, how we not just train, I saw on the list that there's implicit bias training, but how do we screen officers for their responses or how they might respond to uh, calls, uh, interactions, um, potential use of force on holstering a weapon or almost using force, um, but also how they might charge individuals based on racial bias or if they have a racial bias, how do we screen for those things? How do we train for that? How do we determine that it's not happening? Um, I know I had one example that you probably didn't get, which is firearm training. Um, my father was a cop for 29 years, and I don't know whether they do this now, but they used to firearm train with sort of things popping up, and you had to determine in the dark whether that silhouette that popped up was a hazard or not, a risk or not. Um, and you could use st stats from whether a weapon was filed and fired in that type of firearms training to determine, especially if races are used and different racial makeups are used on those, 
to determine whether there's a implicit bias there. So could you discuss, you know, sort of address those issues and how we would determine that and then how would we correct for that? So specific to the firearms training, um, we, we do firearms training. It's only mandated by the MPTC once a year. We do it three times a year and it's pretty ex um, extensive because we also incorporate defensive tactics, de-escalation into all of that training as well. You know, getting back to the um, targeting pop-up systems, uh, I know what you're talking about. We, have, we don't utilize those. Um, and again, the course of instruction for firearms is based at the state level. So we're mandated on how we instruct that and how we, we you know, right down to the last, um, everything's gotta be accounted for. So that it's really regulated at the state MPTC level uh, through firearms instructors and that sort of thing. You know, the original question, Mandy Joe, about, I guess we can only analyze what we can see. So, I mean, we do an extensive, you know, interview process through hiring and in psychological evaluations, but, you know, I guess we kind of go by keeping an eye on our officers, having proper supervision, having an unbelievable amount of training, so that if there are questions or concerns there, I think we would recognize them, but I don't know if there's a mechanism in place to kind of see something, you know, in the future. I, I don't know exactly if that's what you are asking, but, um, you know, it's really about making sure that we hire the right people, do an extensive amount of training, have proper, you know, there's two things, reliability and, and police officers and police departments really, um, you know, become an issue and it really comes down to training and supervision. And, and I guess one of the things I was getting at was, did you ever analyze um, in terms of stops, hmm. what, whether, not, not who's stopped, say, or what the call is, but whether a suspect is actually charged with a crime and what that crime is based on racial biases. We know in the court system in terms of sentencing, there's a lot of racial bias in sentencing. Right. Um, have we ever looked at our statistics to determine whether the decision to charge and what to charge with is also informed by racial bias? Uh, I think the simple answer to that is no. Um, most of what we do as far as tracking is based on vehicle stops and maybe not criminal charges. We, I, I aired and I think it was the finance committee meeting when I said that we didn't always track or have the ability to track the arrest numbers and race makeup and Gabe corrected me on that and told me I was wrong. So, um, you know, my correction there, um, I wasn't sure that in every booking process of booking procedure, we were able to um, go back and get all that information. But as far as criminal charges, we can track it. You know, what's in an officer's mind at the time of, of making a decision to make an arrest? Um, you know, all we can do is track those arrest numbers and see if one officer is arresting too many 21 year old females or if one officer is stopping too many people um, who are Hispanic. So those types of things we track, but um, getting into the minds of the officers, not so much about why they did something. Okay, and I have, I have one other question that relates to juveniles. Um, mm -hmm. We have a, a fairly robust detective system um, and a patrol officer system. Do we have anyone dedicated to dealing with juveniles and you know, for interviews for either whether the juvenile is a suspect or someone involved, you know, on the, on the victim side. Um, but also, what do we do? What is our policy? Or do we tend to have a policy as it relates to juveniles who might have committed a crime to keep them out of the system and do some sort of counseling that does not involve actually charging them with crimes? So we sure do. And it's a lot of it's based in law. And I'm going to again turn this one over to Captain Young because he ran the detective bureau for her for, and probably had many more dealings with juveniles than I. Oh, Ron, if you don't mind me putting on the spot. No, happy to, Chief. So you, it, it's ironic because I just rewrote the juvenile policy um, while well, reviewed and, and amended it about well, three or four months ago, right, right when uh, COVID hit. So back probably February and March. As we know, there were some sweeping changes as it relates to juveniles um, here in the state at, at, at the statute level. So we do have a juvenile officer. We, while we don't call him a juvenile officer, he actually wears a bunch of different hats. He's our liaison to the juvenile court system, uh, Detective Marcus Humber. 
and he meets and deals with both the prosecution and the clerk's office over that regular basis. We charge very few juveniles with criminal acts. I wish I had a number with you, but I'm going to say it was less than 10 last, last calendar year. We tend, to, we tend to do diversion before diversion was a thing, quite frankly. Um, we, we haven't really ever made it. This was before the juvenile diversion or before the juvenile laws changed. We just never really have charged a lot of juvenile people here with crimes. As it relates to dealing with people for being interviewed on the victim end, we have people that are specifically trained um, here that do that. Um, and what we are incapable of doing, we kind of put our head on the shoulders of the Northwestern District Attorney's Office for forensic interviewing if need be. We've, we've long supported that process. Um, we are a member of the SART team, the, special, the, the sexual assault response team. And the sexual assault response team, and while this is not just indicative just of children who've been victimized by sexual assault, but it gives us a great platform and a roadmap on what can happen if we re-victimize victims. And we kind of utilize in that paradigm and kind of bring it down to other levels. I recognize how impactful it is um, for a police officer to deal with a juvenile. Um, and it, 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 it's really something that's outlined by policy. We actually have a very extensive policy on, on juvenile on juvenile law. Um, I hate the term, we call it handling juveniles. I really should change that. I have the power to do it and I didn't do it. But that's, that's what we use as, as a platform. Yeah. Anything else, Mandy Joe? <laughs> no, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Dorothy Pam. Um, this is a question about the gun training that comes down through the state. Um, one of the things, I, I'm the daughter of a nationally ranked marksman, and he would often comment that uh, when police would shoot and they would kill somebody, when all they need to do is to stop them, which would mean get them in the leg. Um, are your training standards, do they teach you just to go for the easy spots, the torso and the head? Or are people actually taught how to use a gun to stop somebody as opposed to kill them? So the simple question of that is that the standard doesn't get that specific. Um, it doesn't say, you know, if you're, if you're having to use a force of that nature, you know, the specifics are that you would shoot center mass and the leg may be a center mass if that's what their individual is, you know, showing to, to, to the officer. But uh, the, the training doesn't get that specific that where you would, um, you know, just trying to um, shoot somebody in the hand or, or in the or on the knee or something of that nature. It's not that specific about where where to shoot that individual. Chief, could I just interject there, sir? You bet. Um, it, it does say in our policy, madam, that we don't shoot to kill. It says we shoot to stop. It says it right in our policy. And we train the officers that way. I was muted, so you didn't hear me say thank you. That's very good. Melanie? Yes, two more questions. One was about the role of the unions. Could you say more how the unions might reward uh, police peep officers who are doing a good job and how they might uh, be um, uh, responding to police with a bad record? And the second question was about data. Did you point us to where we could get access to data about the kinds of calls and special um, by demographics? Like if you could see that, see the data of the last five years based on the demographics, including race. Sure, so the specifics to the data, whatever you need, um, you would go through if it's not something that you can easily access on our website, and if you need it for five years, you won't easily be able to access that. Uh, you'll need to go through Captain Ting if it's specific to arrest and or motor vehicle stop data, and he can get that for you. It might take him some time. You know, as far as the role of the unions, um, you know, you know, the unions have a role in protecting officers if there's an internal investigation. And, you know, they have some spelled out as we do as an agency about the process of a potential internal investigation. Um, and the unions do play a role in protecting officers. There's no question about that. Um, 
You know, it's, it's, it's a tricky one because, you know, I used to be a union president and now I'm a police officer executive. So I would like to see unions go away where in my previous life, I was a union president. Um, I think from, I would say, at least say in Amherst, the relationship between myself, the Captain Ting and Captain Young, who are administration and the police union is strong. Um, you know, we have very few grievances. I think our officers understand how professional we are and the need for all of the policies and everything that we demand. Um, you know, an example, we just changed the policy on things like what officers can post on social media, that sort of thing, and changing that. And it wasn't real popular with the police officers because we've had to oversee things like taking photos with your kids in uniform at, at home, and we have to regulate how that happens, and it's not real popular. So, you know, it's really about communication and why we're doing the things that we do. But, um, you know, the, the unions have very specific roles, and it's about protecting their officers, and we have – I have a different role and it's about making sure the community feels, you know, secure and safe and also about the fact that we're doing the right things for the community. So. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Uh, yes. Um, you, you touched on the training that police so officers get both before they get to you and afterwards on issues like opioid, mental health crises, domestic disputes, you know, I, I and I put in a large range of social issues um, that aren't, you were speeding, um, um, you were in burglary. Are there any examples outside of an Amherst where a police force has said, we want to staff the police force with at least one person who's not actually coming through the police academy, but it's coming through a community mental health service academy that would work side by side with the police um, because I think I think getting some training on these things um, if you frequently encounter them you'll get better and better and better at it but if each of you has a few incidences a year um, how do you de-escalate um, or deal with it and I was just reading um, it was on front page news in Connecticut of someone who was in the middle of a schizophrenic breakdown and he ended up not surviving. And they're saying, but he had a record of those problems. And if they had one had checked, they could have called in a mental health person to sure. calm him down. So I'm just, you know, I saw that you, you have vacancies on the force right now. So, you know, it's a question of would there ever be thinking about, um, then you can't get something else done, so it would be a whole extra person. Um, do you do that with grants? So that's my question. Do we have examples out there? I mean, I'll start off and then I might have Captain Young jump in, but so we have civilian advocates that work with us in the police department specific to domestic violence cases. And it's a grant that we started, oh boy, at least 10 years ago through the University of Massachusetts. Um, and it's been very, very successful. Um, she, she has an, she's a civilian advocate with specialties towards domestic violence. She has an office here in the police station. She works with the police department and then the detectives, but more importantly, she works with the victims all the way through the court process or the counseling sessions and that sort of thing. Before COVID hit, we were looking to write a grant to have a very, the, we were gonna mirror what we do with domestic violence for mental health issues. So we wanna have a, professional in-house with an office in the police station and do exactly what we're doing with domestic violence training. And I don't know if that completely answers your question. Ron, is there anything you wanted to add on that? No, I, I, I think that's accurate, Chief. Uh, you know, kind of where CIT programs have evolved across the state and for that matter for the country is to have a clinician um, for co-response. So th there's always going to be a safety concern. So if a clinician goes by themselves, there's the issue. But as, as you bring up, if a police officer goes by himself, that expertise doesn't really, it's really kind of the, the idea is the team, the two, team the two of them together to form a team um, so that you have both things. You have a safety, you can deal with the safety issues there, but you have somebody that has maybe a greater level of de-escalation skills on board or maybe some, some maybe can give some recovery ideas or some crisis intervention ideas 
to that person so that we can get them to where they need to be, whether it's back to clinical support options, whether they need to, you know, in the most severe case, if they have to be seen at the ED and so forth. So that's really where we'd like to be is to have a clinician here for call response and for follow-up calls. But as the chief pointed out, when C-19 hit, it kind of disrupted exactly where we're gonna head in terms of grant the grant funding or grant applications and things of that nature. And I, I guess, you know, I was thinking of a team as opposed mm -hmm. to one, but you, if you're grant funding the people, they, they aren't necessarily going to be a permanent feature of the force unless you find a grant right. funder who will give you a grant every year, you know, in perpetuity. Yeah. You're just, you know. Which would, that's my favorite kind of grant person, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I, so I guess, you know, you don't need to answer tonight, but I'm just curious whether there are any police forces of towns of our size, so not big police, you know, big cities, who have said, you know, we could have a different composition on our regular police force where the slot is, give them whatever name you want to give them, but they didn't come through the police academy. They came another route. Um, so it, those kinds of examples, because I think, um, and maybe there's some in Europe. I think people are starting to think through that because we have these other issues, um, the support services, the police can't be trained for everything. Um, and, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, and it makes a lot of sense, quite frankly. So. If I may jump in, there is Eugene, Oregon, which has, is the home of University of Oregon, has a program called In Cahoots. Which, which is, it's a separate from the police department, but they work in tandem with the police department. And that's something we've, I've looked at at least. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for just on, you know, do we have some models? And then of course it's how do we fund it if, if the model works well. Thank you, Paul. Pat, you have your hand up. Um, yes, um, I missed some of Mandy Joe's questions and the response because so if I'm overlapping, I apologize. Uh, we've seen lots of um, episodes recently of uh, people of color being Karened is the quote is what it's called now, where they're doing something simple and normal, and they are targeted by white residents or white visitors or whatever. That happens in Amherst. And um, there was recently an incident I found out about where um, three or four teen black teenage boys were playing in the backyard at four o'clock in the afternoon. And they were, um, the police were called um, to stop the noise or whatever. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in your reaction to that. What happened, uh, what would that, uh, what what happened when the officer got there because you said that you respond to all calls and how is the white person who called or Karen um, dealt with sure so I can't I, I don't know specifically about that specific call Pat um, but I certainly can find out if there was a time frame you could give me and we can talk off off camera at, at a, a different time for sure but that, that's, it's happening. And um, it's an area where we're starting to now have conversation with our dispatch center personnel to, um, to do just that, do more screening about, okay, why are you calling? You know, what are you calling for? And I think about the individual that happened last year with the UMass gentleman um, um, who was walking across campus and somebody called and it very right. eerily, you know, same circumstances. The guy was just walking across campus and it was a UMass incident, but we were made very aware of it as well. So that it needs to be involving more screening process through the dispatcher. And then what we're also doing is have the dispatchers forward those calls down to a police supervisor or a police officer so that we can screen and get more information because you're right. Just somebody acting suspicious is typically how those calls come in, need to be vetted more. Um, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So it's, some, it's an area we're looking at and there will be policy changes on that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. There are no, no other counselor questions at this time. And we have a very robust audience. In fact, uh, you're the most popular 
that since we've gone virtual. Um, and so we, at one point we've had as many as 60 attendees and that is not counting the people on Amherst Media. So I'm going to ask people who have raised their hand. Um, if you want to make public comment, uh, please raise your hand so I can get a sense of how many people we have. And so I can decide how much time we can give people. All right. Um, given the number of people that we have, I'm going to ask that you try to limit your comments to two minutes. Uh, I'm going to call on you. And when we, I call on you, please state your name and where you live. I do want to be very straightforward and say we are looking for comments from Amherst residents first. And if we have time, we will move to out people who do not live in Amherst. Um, and I also want to say that given the awkwardness that we've run into of trying to bring people into the room, we're not going to try to do that because we may lose connectivity with you. It all has to do with how you signed on and so forth. So I'm going to start with um, the person who's on top for me. And so Lydia Irons, would you please tell me your name and where you live? Hello, my name is Lydia Irons. I live in Amherst. I'm in District 5. Um, and I have a couple of things that I'd like to say um, about the policing in Amherst. The first is that um, according to all of the public data, 93.6% of calls that our police get are for nonviolent behavior that clearly don't require weapons. Um, I'm wondering why these needs aren't filled by EMTs, mental health professionals, and community resources. Um, there are plenty of community resources here in Amherst that um, could respond to these calls. Only 6% of calls, uh, the reasons are including disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, assaulting a police officer, um, are violent calls. So in the source for this information is the F21 budget, page 52, 1,132 calls involving violent behavior out of 17 plus. Um, so I, that's something that I think is really important to be pointed out about um, the, the Amherst Police Department. Also, Amherst is policed differently depending on where you live, and there is a lot of data that can be collected about where the Amherst Police Department does their patrolling. They are constantly patrolling the apartment complexes when they haven't been called or asked to be there, um, and there has been lots of um, community talk about that you don't need to be there. The richer neighborhoods are not patrolled in this same way or with this same frequency at all. Um, there's plenty of data about that and you can even see data visualizations of maps of where these patrol is, patrols are happening. Um, by far the most officer initiated calls happen in North Pleasant Street, about 600 last year, which is double the number of officer initiated calls in any other street in the same time frame. Um, the Puffton apartment complex is on North Pleasant. The Craig shelter is also on North Pleasant. Um, and I think that there are also the numbers that the amount of money that the Amherst Police Department spends on gas alone is astronomical. Um, it's 42,000 from June 2009 to May 2020. That's about $117 a day on gasoline for 38 officers to patrol Amherst, even though most calls are for help in quotes that happen on just a few streets. Why are officers spending so much time and money patrolling areas that don't need to be patrolled? The community doesn't want them there. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, Lynn, but um, I have a testimony from an Amherst individual that has asked to have it shared here. Um, but I would also like to cede the floor to any, um, anybody else. Thank you, first of all, I appreciate that. And actually you have uh, reached your time limit. So if you would, please send the testimony to town council at amherstma.gov. Okay. And I failed to mention earlier that we will not be responding to the questions from the audience, but we will be taking note of them. And as with the other unanswered questions from council, we'll be uh, looking for answers to them as well. Um, Mattia Kramer.
My name is Mattia Kramer. I live on East Pleasant Street in Amherst. Um, I want to just specifically say that this conversation uh, is here. We're happening now because of anti-Black racism. Um, and I, my experience at recent protests has given me the opportunity um, to hear from a number of folks of color sharing their experiences with local policing. And um, so this is a question or comment both for the council members as well as the police, which is to say, will there be efforts as these conversations are happening now between council and police, will there be efforts to um, solicit, explicitly solicit feedback probably anonymously from affected communities? So uh, whereas right now this conversation is happening primarily among folks who um, are not the constituents um, that we're most concerned about. So making concerted efforts to, bringing, to bring that voice into the conversation is what I'm concerned about and um, would implore all members on this call uh, to do. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the next hand up is Irv, and would you please identify yourself and where you live? You need to unmute. My name, my name is Irv Rhodes. I live in South Amherst on Pondview Drive. Um, I've actually, th this has been an impressive. The entire pres presentation by the members of the police department has been really, really impressive. Uh, one of the things that comes through uh, when you look at the data is that for whatever reason, um, police departments um, have morphed, morphed into uh, social service agencies. Uh, and, and, and that really needs to be looked at in, in, in a closer fashion. Uh, because when you think about the training that you're talking about to deal with mental health issues, opioid issues, domestic abuse issues, uh, those are the kinds of things you would, you would think um, would be uh, handled in other kinds of ways. And I understand that when you have a call that's a domestic abuse issue or an opioid issue, there's also a safety issue there. And so an officer may be required uh, to go along with someone from a social, social service agency. Uh, so that's one comment. The other one is that I am, I am also uh, aware of and impressed with that you have implicit bias training. Uh, the question I, I would have is that, is this implicit bias training uh, done on an ongoing basis with all officers on, on, a, on, a, regular, uh, on a regularly scheduled uh, basis. And the third one is um, the access of data um, to the general public. I just heard this other person go through some data. Uh, those data points are uh, quite important uh, so that uh, the public can have a sense of what exactly the police department does on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's really important because it's, it's an impressive kind of array of data. Uh, most people, uh, uh, citizens, don't have access to their data on a day-to-day -day basis in a kind of way that would allow them to be able to look at the, the police department and say, wow, so this is what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And here's, there's, here's how they're spending their time. Um, and then, from there, if you're looking, if we're, if, if at some point there is a um, decision to go ahead with some kind of oversight, uh, then that will give us some reference points to whether that is needed or not. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Rick Last, you are next. Please identify yourself and where you live. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Rick Last, and I live on uh, Middle Street in Amherst, and listening with a lot of interest here, to say the least, you know, these are times when racial justice is at the forefront, <clears throat> and no department is immune from systemic racism. You know, things go wrong, they go deadly wrong at times when police encounter people of color. You know, change is being demanded around our country, as everybody sees. And uh, a thorough examination of the 
uh, role of the police in public safety um, in our society in terms of public safety is really demanded right now. I was listening, especially with a lot of interest around this uh, specialized training and echoing what a lot of people have said already that there are professionals out there. <clears throat> and I think Kathy was the first one to bring this up that um, a lot of these calls, I'm sure, don't end up with any kind of inform enforcement or arrest. And yet the first person that gets seen um, is a police officer with a gun. And it might not be the certainly best thing to de-escalate, no matter how much training uh, you would have. Um, so the best thing would have would be some professionals. And I'm really... Um, happy that um, uh, Paul brought up the CAHOOTS program, and that is in Eugene, Oregon. And um, when the police get 911 calls in, that are nonviolent in nature, the calls get rooted to CAHOOTS. And they send out a medic, nurse, and a mental health professional to get dispatched. In 2019, of the 24,000 calls, this is a town of uh, 170,000, 24,000 calls that got um, rooted to cahoots, only 150 ever needed any eventual police backup. 99.4% were handled without any armed police. And, um, and, and these were, you know, and the calls they got were approximately like 30% of the calls that came into 911. So it's, it's a matter of like redirecting our, um, public safety budget and thinking about that. I mean, we can do all the training we want, but if there are trained professionals to uh, um, go out there, I think something about a quarter percent of the police killings in, in this country um, uh, happen with people with uh, mental health issues. And no matter, and as, um, I think Detective Young said, you know, we don't try to you know, solve the problems, but we uh, try to assess the problems and we don't pretend to be cl clinicians. Well, there are clinicians out there. So it, it, it makes absolutely no sense that an uh, armed officer would be the first on, on these calls. I think of the, uh, you, know, you can cut me off if I've gone too far, but um, I think there was uh, uh, about 18,000 Amherst police calls last year, and about half of these, at least, and you can correct me, arguably didn't require any armed police response and would be better served you know, by responses from medical, social, or mental health professionals. You talk That's about- Last, but you really need to complete. That's it, but thank you. Okay. Um, we have other people waiting, and I really want to make sure that they have an opportunity. Uh, Terry Mullen, please raise your hand and tell us your name and your uh, address and unmute your mic. Hi, my name is Terry Mullen. I live in Amherst on Northeast Street. Um, I wanted to read a testimonial that uh, about an experience with the um, police that I was asked to read by someone who didn't actually feel safe enough to come on this call themselves, which I think is nerve wracking to me. Um, an Amherst community member who is disabled a uh, person of color reached out to share that they have faced abuses from an officer in the area who uses his ties to APD to gain information and harass people he has abused. For this specific person, the harassment from APD has looked like unfounded wellness checks and officers showing up at their friends' places without clear reason. APD has never taken accountability for this behavior. Every time this community member reports the continued harassment, they were told the officer can never find any the officers can never find any proof that the police did those wellness checks or that anything was reported to begin with. This person and others who have had experiences similar to theirs 
have been told by officers and members of the court that they're exaggerating and only looking to ruin the police department's credibility. But what this anonymous community member wants is safety and for their well-being to, ta to be taken seriously and for town accountability for employees' behavior both on and off the job. Um, I also wanted to add that at my apartment complex just a few weeks ago, we did get a wellness check that was, um, I was not involved, but it was very serious, it looked, and there was a lot of force for what looked like three very young, um, very scared uh, youth. I, maybe they were female, I'm not sure but it was a lot of force and a lot of people on site trying to help someone who ended up being handcuffed to a gurney. And it was just looked really scary and really traumatic for everyone involved. And I wonder what other things could have happened to help that person that wouldn't involve so many people with guns. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, Alicia. Deshonez, and if you would like to correct my pronunciation of your name, I will not be all be offended. Please state your name and where you live. Yeah, my name is Alicia Deshonez. You're very close. Um, you headed towards the fancier pronunciation. Um, I actually live on campus, on the UMass campus. I'm part of District 2. I'm a resident instructor who lives in the halls and have interacted pretty frequently with both uh, the Amherst Police Department and the UMass Police Department. Um, I just wanted to share and echo and elevate a lot of the other voices that have shared. I don't think that the police need to respond to a lot of the calls that they are responding to. I appreciate that um, you're trying to be proactive and thinking about ways um, to not like work reactively and harm people. But, and it's like pretty clear where those pain points are. Most of the calls that happen, happen in September and October and in May. Those are when new members are joining our community. And I think that there could be some other ways to address that other than just policing. If you're truly doing, wanting to do proactive work, there could be work done to like connect with the community, help them to understand how to connect with their new neighbors and address noise or suspicious behavior in a more meaningful and community-centered way. Um, I'm also concerned because based off of information I've been able to find, between May 2019 and May 2020, it seems that a lot of the calls that were logged um, were initiated by police themselves. Only about 13% of activities logged as police calls were initiated by someone calling 911, while 44% of calls seem to be initiated by the police themselves. I'm curious <laughs> as to like why that's the case or where those calls are coming from and why the police are initiating so much interaction with the community when they don't seem to be calling or asking for it. I'm wondering if that happens to be because of some of this um, proactive policing that happens to be happening. Um, so would encourage uh, Amherst Police Department and both the town council to really think effectively around what does proactive policing mean um, and how does that support our community or does it not support our community? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Nathan Dipla, please identify yourself and where you live. Yeah, my name is Nathan Diplock. I live in District 1. Um, I think first question, so Captain Young, uh, during his section of the talk, mentioned that one of the challenges to policing in Amherst was that uh, the police are highly visible, and that would suggest that being less visible uh, is easier in terms of policing. Um, and so if it's easier to do your job without the public knowing or seeing what you're doing, isn't that a problem? Um, and I, I would think like if you're proud of what you're doing, right, you would want as much visibility as possible. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I also at some point in the talk, it was mentioned that uh, the police department was looking in uh, to tasers um, due to an increase in calls related to mental health crises. Um, and I, I think as a member of the community, that's a bit different from how I would like our community to respond to mental health crises. I mean, even the fact that that was being considered, I think, speaks to the, the fact that we need more transparency and oversight in how these decisions are made for the community. Um, yeah, and overall, I think we need to 
uh, just rethink the role of police in our society and we can start doing that in our own community. Um, I think we need to uh, defund and disarm the Amherst Police Department and reinvest in other avenues to support our community. Thanks. Um, Jamie Fisher Hertz, please identify yourself. And yours. Hi. You um, yes, my name is Jamie, and I am with. I went to Amherst High School, um, and I'm applying to Amherst to UMass Amherst Graduate School right now. Um, but I live in Sunderland, um, so I'm wondering if it's okay for me to give some testimony right now. Anyways. Um. You're not a resident of Amherst. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, I live in Sunderland. Um, I attended Amherst High School and my whole family lives in Amherst, but I'm currently living in Sunderland about 0.1 miles from the Amherst line. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I've been really um, inspired and excited to hear about all of the ideas that the people on this call have shared about wanting to transform um, our town to being a more safe place for all people. Um, I'm really grateful to be a part of a town that is so active in um, wanting to change things and also um, was excited to hear that the police are hoping to have a task force um, and wondering more about that process um, and sort of what kinds of community uh, impacts will be most helpful. Um, I think that there are several agencies that are already in Amherst that are doing a lot of work for our community that we could redirect funding to at this time. Um, for example, the Crisis Stabilization Center at the um, Clinical Services Outreach, um, they have locations in Hampshire County and they respond immediately to mental health emergencies. Um, there's a number that both youth and adults can call and they can respond on location or people can come to them. Um, there's also the Bridge Family Resource Center, which is in Amherst. Um, I work in early intervention and a lot of the families that require social services get a lot of them through this Family Resource Center. Um, so there are definitely agencies that are already in place that we could work with. Um, I think that the CAHOOTS program has been mentioned a couple of times. And uh, I just want to reiterate that there are organizations that can do that work. Um, Thank you so much, and I see the rest of my time. Thank you. Um, Zoe Crabtree, please identify yourself and where you live. Hi, I think I'm unmuted, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Zoe Crabtree, and I live in South Amherst. I believe that I'm in uh, Darcy's district. Um, so I just wanted to uh, speak to a couple of things about um, some of the money that we that the department spends um they have 77 staff members um which includes 38 patrol officers for about uh, 14,000 residents um and on if you divide the amount of money that is spent on um staff wages that's about uh, 72,000 uh, dollars per staff member in a year and those numbers are from the 2018 um wage numbers that were posted online um, which is significantly higher than than teachers are are paid in our area. I'd also like to to mention again that um, the department spends uh, just under forty three thousand uh, dollars the past year on um, gasoline and about the same on vehicle maintenance. Um, which, uh, if you kind of divide that out, about around the thirty eight officers driving in maybe eight hour shifts for. Um, uh, about 40 hour weeks for at least 20 weeks a year to give them lots of vacation. Um, that works out to um, just over 30,000 hours a year of time driving or idling in their vehicles. Um, the website says that the patrol officers spend most of their time in their shift in their cars. Uh, so if you do the math out, that's about um, 3.4 years of time driving or idling every year um, where they're just sitting around kind of uh, running their cars or, or driving their cars around. So um, I think if we're going to be uh, having a, a climate change agenda or really thinking about having climate change being central to our, our agenda, then um, we won't want them to be uh, using that many resources um, every year. Thank, Thank you. you. Comments. Um, I'm going to move back to the council and we've completed public comment. 
uh, if is there anybody else in the council that would like to make a comment at this time? And otherwise we're going to stop. Andy, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, as chair of the finance committee, um, I have been spending a lot of time thinking about the, um, some of the budget questions that have been talked about, including making funds available for bringing in other agencies that could contribute to the work of the department. Um, we are very tightly budgeted right now, um, even more so than in a normal year because of how COVID-19 is affecting our revenue sort stream right at the present and for the next year or two years. Um, the reality is that the police department was just pointed out has about 38 patrol officers and not all of them are available. Um, some are in training and um, with vacation and trying to cover three shifts. Uh, uh, it is a real question as to whether um, it is ever going to be feasible um, to um, diminish the size of the department staffing for patrol officers and still to be able to meet the uh, needs to service the community. Uh, so the idea that we would easily be able to just transfer some money in order to um, be able to take on the kind of different approaches that have been suggested, um, I'm concerned as to whether that's really a feasible alternative. So that's, thank you. I can just do one last check uh, before we uh, adjourn the meeting. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, I want to say that we've had an incredibly good presentation by the police department and we've had excellent questions by the town council and some townspeople, but I really enjoyed hearing the voice of young people and their points of view are not easily absorbed sometimes into what we're thinking. Um, but I just feel so much of my time here at Amherst, I don't hear that voice in the town of Amherst. I don't hear it. And our committees, which require so much time and work, are filled with older people with experience in what they're doing. So when we do come up with our um, new committee, which um, I think Meg Gage has some very good words that it should not use the word civilian and it shouldn't use the word oversight, and I agree with her arguments, but this, this committee that, that we're talking about, looking and examining at the police department working together that we must have some young voices on that too because we just need to we need to hear them and we need to integrate them into our voices so thank you so just let me conclude by again thanking um captain i mean i'm sorry police chief scott livingstone captain young captain ting um and for this very, very uh, thorough presentation. While it hasn't answered all of our questions, I will confer with the council and also with Paul, as well as um, looking at the tape and see what other questions we need to advance to you. Um, some of those, in fact, will be data. And obviously some of that may take some time and some transparency. And down the road, as we hear more and more from other constituents, we'll, council will make a decision along with the town manager as to what kind of committee there might be to work with the police department in creating that greater transparency for our community. Again, I want to reiterate, this is just the beginning of a conversation, but it was an extremely informative presentation and informative comments as well. So I just want to thank everyone and particularly our police department for putting this great effort forward. So with that, the meeting is adjourned.